Preface and Chapter One of Spiders. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Spiders by Cecil Warburton. Preface The modest dimensions of this book are perhaps sufficient indication that it is not intended as an aid to the collector there are about five hundred and fifty known species of spiders in the united kingdom alone and at least an equal number of pages would be needed to describe them our concern is with the habits and modes of life of spiders especially of those as are most frequently met with and most easily recognized and the reader especially if he is fortunate enough to spend an occasional holiday in southern europe will find little in the following pages which he cannot verify or disprove by his own observations indeed the hope that some of his readers may be induced to investigate on their own account has actuated the writer throughout and has led him to lay considerable stress upon the methods of research and the ingeniously devised experiments by means of which whatever knowledge we possess has been obtained cecil warburton cambridge march nineteen twelve chapter one a survey of the field there are certain days of the year when the immense wealth of spider industry going on all around us is revealed in a way calculated to strike even the least observant we all know and derive no peculiarly pleasant thrill from the knowledge that we can if so minded find abundance of cobwebs and their occupants by visiting the cellar or the tool house and probably we have all at times noticed with a languid interest large circular webs on our favorite rose bushes with a spider motionless in the center but some spring or autumn morning when the night has been foggy and the sun has only just succeeded in dispersing the mists every bush and hedge is seen to be draped every square foot of lawn and meadow to be carpeted with spiders silk there has been no special activity in the domain of these creatures but every silken line is beaded with drops perhaps fifty times its diameter and what yesterday required careful observation to detect is now visible yards away and we realize for once something of the prodigious activity constantly going on though ordinarily unnoted and it never entirely ceases true hibernation if it ever occurs is not the rule among spiders and there is no time of the year when some species may not be found at work beat trees or bushes over an old umbrella or sweep grass and herbage with a sweeping net in summer and you will never draw a blank some spiders are sure to be found in winter such measures are profitless but if you take the trouble to grub among ground vegetation or shake fallen leaves over a newspaper or search under stones or logs of wood you will have no difficulty in finding spiders enough and by no means dormant i have even seen an enthusiastic collector remove inches of snow and disinter rare species from among the roots of the grass beneath spiders then are plentiful enough and it is not only individuals that are numerous but there are vastly more kinds of species than most people dream of the rev o picard cambridge in a book under the modest title of the spiders of dorset indispensable to all british collectors quaintly observes that most of his friends claim acquaintance with three kinds of spiders the garden spider the harvest spider 
and the little red spider two of which as it happens are not spiders at all yet the british list contains about five hundred and fifty species and the spiders of the world though only very partially investigated already include many thousands of known and described forms in this little work we shall not at all consider the spider tribe from the collector's point of view we shall concern ourselves rather with habits and modes of life and such structural modifications as are correlated therewith certain well-defined groups of spiders we shall recognize but specific names will interest us little and we might do worse than step out on such a spring morning as we have imagined and rapidly survey the field which lies open for our investigation first then examine a little more closely one of the garden bushes in which the spiders have been so busy and the chances are that three different types of snare will be readily distinguishable there are sure to be some of the familiar wheel-like snares of epeira but note also the fine spun hammocks of lanifia with stay lines above and below and the irregular labyrinths of theridion its lines crossing and recrossing without apparent method these are sedentary spiders and always to be found at home all spiders spin for some purpose or other but these or at all events epeira have brought the art to its highest perfection leave them for the present and examine a sunny wall or fence you may chance to see a little zebra striped flat bodied spider exploring the surface and directing its opera glass like eyes in all directions in search of prey this is one of the adidae or jumping spiders few and sober colored in this country but extraordinarily abundant and often extremely beautiful in tropical regions pause at the iron railing before leaving the garden and observe how the topmost bar and the knobs which crown the uprights are alive with spiders mostly very small and obviously of many different kinds extremely busy about something that it may be worth while to investigate later then go on into the lane and note in the banks of the hedgerows the great sheet webs and tubes of agelina a near relative of the house spider but with a cobweb thanks to its situation comparatively free from accumulations of dust and filth the creatures skipping dry shod on the surface of the river or pond though often called water spiders are true insects the real water spider argyronetta which though air breathing spends most of its time below the surface of the water is not to be found everywhere but there are many riparian species which are semi-amphibious in their habits and have no objection to a wetting finally turn into the wood and look carefully on the ground especially where last year's leaves are still lying you are certain to see a few and may very likely see countless myriads of sober colored rapidly moving wolf spiders vacosidae roaming in quest of food no stay-at-homes these but rovers trusting to speed and agility and not to guile for their food supply all the spiders we have observed so far are in active pursuit of their daily business but if we turn over stones or logs or look under sheets of loose bark we shall find others quiescent for the moment but waiting for nightfall to begin their operations but we have probably seen enough to show that a pretty wide field for investigation lies immediately at hand and that a detailed study of what we have cursorily glanced at will occupy us so long that we shall have little time for considering the spiders of other lands in the first place however 
we had better make quite sure of what is meant by a spider. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Spiders by Cecil Warburton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What is a spider? Not many years ago, the group Insecta was held, even by zoologists, to include numberless small creatures, centipedes, spiders, mites, etc., which further study has shown to present essential differences of structure. And in popular language, any fairly minute animal is still an insect, just as any insect is popularly a fly or in the united states a bug scientifically the use of the term insect is now much restricted though still extensive enough in all conscience since it includes many more than a quarter of a million known species zoologists recognize a large group of animals characterized by having no internal skeleton but a more or less firm external coating of a peculiar substance called chitin often strengthened by calcareous deposits which necessitates the presence of joints in their bodies and especially in their limbs if they are to move freely just as medieval suits of armor required to be jointed these are the arthropoda one subdivision of this group consists of aquatic animals breathing by gills and known as crustacea crabs lobsters shrimps and water fleas are familiar examples and with the exception of the so-called land crabs the only crustaceans habitually found on land are wood lice the other arthropoda are air breathing and since their characteristic breathing organs are branching tubes known as trachea the term tracheata is sometimes used to include them all they fall naturally into three divisions the myriapoda the insecta and the arachnida and it is in this last named division that we shall find the spiders the myriapoda are the centipedes and millipedes and having said this we may dismiss them for insects and arachnids are strictly limited as to legs and no myriapod can ever be mistaken for a spider the arachnida are so varied in structure that it is not easy to give characteristics common to them all and to any general statement there are bound to be exceptions but for practical purposes it may be said that while an insect when mature has only six legs and a pair of feelers or antennae of quite different structure arachnids have normally eight legs and their feeling organs are not antennae but leg-like pedipalps most insects are distinguishable at once by the possession of wings which are never found among the arachnida and they generally undergo a marked transformation or metamorphosis in their progress from an egg to maturity taking on at first the form of a caterpillar or grub and then that of a chrysalis but as there are many wingless insects and many in which the metamorphosis is very slight the test supplied by these characteristics is only of partial application and we shall do better to rely on the number of legs and the nature of the feeling organs if therefore we find a small wingless animal with eight legs and a pair of feelers which are not thread-like but much of the same character as the legs though not used for locomotion we may be sure that we are concerned with an arachnid but is it a spider now some groups of the arachnida may be put out of court at once as having an appearance so characteristic that no confusion is possible such are the scorpions and the minute chernididae or false 
scorpions but this cannot be said of the phalangidae or harvestmen or of the acarina or mites members of which groups not only may be but frequently are popularly taken for spiders in fact the phalangidae are very commonly spoken of as harvest spiders and the red spider is a mite a very brief inspection however with a pocket lens will settle the matter without the least difficulty a spider's body consists of two parts a cephalothorax head plus thorax and an abdomen there is a waist but no neck the eight legs are attached to the cephalothorax and the abdomen is not segmented or ringed like that of an insect but entire and bears at its extremity or on its under surface a little group of spinnerets or finger-like projections from which the spider's silk proceeds for the moment these three characteristics will suffice the waist behind the leg-bearing portion of the body the unsegmented legless abdomen and the spinnerets a harvestman for instance lacks the waist and its abdomen is segmented mites are a very varied form and in some the body is more or less divided into two portions but at least two pairs of legs will be found to be attached to the hinder portion and neither harvestmen nor mites possess the spinnerets which are the most striking characteristic of the spider some mites like the red spider can spin but the mechanism by which that operation is performed is of quite a different nature having then very readily determined our specimen to be a true spider we may as well use it to note some further structural points the detailed examination of which may be deferred till we have considered their functions note the jaws or chelicerae consisting of a stout basal part and a fang which when not in use is shut down like the blade of a knife note the pedipalps or feelers exactly like small legs but showing by their action that their function is sensory and not locomotor if they are knobbed at the end the specimen is a male otherwise it is a female or as yet immature look closely at the front part of the cephalothorax and several eyes will be visible probably eight they are not compound divided into innumerable facets like those of insects but simple and smooth though to make sure of this the use of a microscope would be necessary finally obtain a view of the under surface of the abdomen and note in front on either side of the middle line two semi-lunar patches of lighter color these are the lung books special breathing organs peculiar to these animals two is the usual number though certain spiders possess a second pair behind the first but the spinning mammalae or spinnerets are still more characteristic and more easily seen though curiously enough it is not among the cleverest spinners that they are most conspicuous in the family to which most of the cellar spiders belong agelinidae and in the elongate brown or mouse colored spiders found lurking under stones Dracidae, they are visible as little finger-like projections at the posterior end of the abdomen but if we have taken our specimen from a circular web epiridae we shall have to look for them more closely in these spiders they are beneath the abdomen near its termination and are not visible from above moreover when at rest their tips are applied together so that they form a small rosette in surface view or in profile a slight cone the best way to capture a spider for examination is to induce it to run up into a small glass specimen tube and if we have adopted this method 
we shall see the spinnerets in use as the animal crawls about the tube it will not move without first attaching a silken cable to the glass and this cable lengthens as the spider progresses so that before long the interior of the tube will be a network of silken threads and its sides will be flecked with little white specks where the threads have been reattached for a new departure and by observing closely we shall be able to note the extreme mobility of the spinnerets in action all spiders spin but it is by no means all spiders that make snares for the purpose of catching prey the fundamental purpose of the spinning organs seems to be to connect the spider with its point of departure the jumping spiders at a day make no snare but this drag line as it has been called comes in very useful when stalking prey on the vertical surface of a wall when a miscalculation at the moment of pouncing upon it would entail a considerable fall were it not for such an anchorage it can hardly be doubted though of course it is incapable of proof that all the more complicated spinning operations originated in this universal spider habit but all known spiders have learnt to apply their power of making silk to other purposes if they do not make snares they at least spin cocoons for the protection of their eggs and if they have a definite home from which they emerge to seek food such a retreat is always more or less lined with silk it is clear that a spider cocoon is quite different from that of an insect it encloses the eggs and is manufactured by the mother whereas among the insects the larva makes the cocoon for the protection of the pupa or chrysalis into which it is about to turn however far from exhaustive the foregoing study of spider structure may be it will suffice for our purposes at least for the present and we may proceed at once to an investigation of one of the most remarkable achievements in the way of spinning the familiar circular snare or wheel web of the garden spider end of chapter two chapter three of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain the circular snare select the most perfect circular snare at hand and examine it attentively in the autumn when the large garden spider apira diademata is mature it will probably be easy to find such a snare a foot or more in diameter it is stretched within an irregular frame of foundation lines of extra thickness and strength and consists of a large number of radii or spokes connected by what appears to be a series of concentric circles in reality a continuous spiral like the hairspring of a watch the central portion is different from the rest of the wheel probably in the very center there is a vacant space and round this a hub consisting of a spiral line different in appearance from that of the main spiral it does not leave a radius exactly at the point where it strikes it and the rather zigzag effect has caused it to be known as the notched zone touch the web and it adheres to the finger but all its lines are not adhesive test this with some fine pointed implement and the foundation lines the radii and the notched zone will give negative results the spiral line alone is viscid and its viscidity is due to the presence of thousands of little beads of gummy matter strung on a thin elastic thread the vast number and uniformity of these beads estimated at a hundred and twenty thousand on a large web excited the wonder and admiration of naturalists 
until it was proved that they were not deposited by the spider as beads at all but as a uniform coating of viscid matter which subsequently arranged itself into equidistant globules easily explicable by the physicist indeed precisely the same phenomenon is seen in a dew-laden web where similar but very much larger beads of water decorate all the lines from the hub of the wheel we shall very likely notice a rather stout cable diverging from the plane of the snare and leading to a nest of leaves spun together here the spider is to be found when not on duty in the center of the wheel and here it constructs its egg cocoons this then is the complete circular snare but we shall understand it much better if we watch the spider at work in its construction the first business of the spider is to lay down the foundation lines any sort of trapezium or even a triangle if large enough in a more or less vertical plane will suffice and under some circumstances the operation is simple enough the spider attaches a line at the point of departure and crawls along spinning as it goes and holding up the newly spun thread by the claws of one of its hind feet till it reaches a suitable spot for its furthest limit it then hauls in the slack and makes it fast it will probably return along the line thus laid down still spinning to the starting point thus doubling the strength of the cable and indeed a large spider will often repeat this operation several times now the upper boundary of the future web is secured it is next necessary to find points of attachment for the lower boundary and the spider either drops or climbs down always carrying a line from one of the ends of the upper line till it reaches a spot suitable for its purpose and the previous performance is repeated if there is any difficulty about a fourth attachment it is always open to the spider to climb back along the two lines already laid down and by carrying a loose line with it to secure at all events a triangular framework this framework whether trapezoid or triangular will be reinforced several times and made thoroughly trustworthy before the work of making the actual snare is proceeded with now the foregoing operation is obviously perfectly simple in certain cases as for instance when a spider has chosen a lattice work or the mouth of an empty barrel as its pitch but snares may easily be found in situations where such a mode of procedure seems impossible in a pine forest for example one may see huge webs stretched at a great height from the ground between boles ten feet apart or one may find such a snare spread across a stream at a spot where the trees on either side do not intermingle their boughs how in such cases does the spider accomplish its purpose there is little doubt that whenever practicable the spider walks around sometimes crawling quite an astounding distance but that it can at need resort to another method is easily proved by a very simple experiment in the house fill any vessel a basin or a bath with water and arrange an upright post in the middle placing a spider upon it if the air in the room is absolutely still the captive is powerless to escape but if draughts are present it will sooner or later disappear and it accomplishes this feat by emitting a thread which caught by the air current is drawn out from its spinnerets till it by and by becomes entangled in the surrounding furniture this power of emitting silk to some little distance and allowing the wind to draw it out is as we shall see 
frequently exercised in the early life of many spiders the foundation lines which may thus have given the spider great trouble to secure are of extreme importance to it and may serve for several snares in succession there is little hesitation or delay about the subsequent operations the spokes of the wheel are readily formed by carrying lines across to opposite points of the framework and uniting them where they intersect they are laid down in no special order but more or less alternation is generally noticeable apparently for the purpose of keeping the tension equally balanced and the spider will occasionally desist in order to go and brace up the framework with additional stays which generally have the effect of converting it to a polygon before long the requisite number of fairly equidistant spokes or radii are visible and then the spider starting from the center rapidly spins a spiral thread consisting of a few coils only to the circumference stepping from spoke to spoke this is only a temporary scaffolding and will not be suffered to remain in the completed snare if the structure is touched at this stage of the operations it does not adhere to the finger the viscid spiral remains to be laid down though it does not hesitate for a moment the spider now works with a peculiar deliberation but the operation will be much better understood by actual observation than by any amount of description and we shall only recommend the reader to note that the new spiral is exceedingly elastic and that at the moment of its attachment to a spoke it is stretched and let go like the string of a bow the spider seems carefully to avoid treading on it as it proceeds utilizing the non-viscid spiral scaffolding already described a little attention to the center of the wheel and the snare is complete some species of apura entirely remove the center leaving a circular empty space while others fill it with an irregular network of threads how does the garden spider avoid getting caught in its own web we have shown that there are many lines which are not viscid and no doubt these are utilized as far as possible but it can hardly happen that the spider never touches adhesive portions of the web with legs or body possibly some explanation is furnished by an ingenious experiment which fabre performed he found that a glass rod lightly smeared with oil did not adhere to the viscid spiral neither did a leg freshly taken from a garden spider unless allowed to remain in contact for a considerable time when however this leg has been washed with bisulfide of carbon which dissolves any kind of oily substance it adhered at once it would seem likely therefore that the legs and body of the spider itself are protected by some oily exudation from any danger of adherence to its own lines End of chapter 3chapter four of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain mental powers of spiders before leaving the garden spider let us undertake some little investigation of its mental powers if it possesses any the commonest mistake with regard to all animals is to interpret their actions from the human standpoint and to credit them with emotions and with deliberate forethought of which there is in reality no proof whatever the power to spin such a complicated snare as we have just described predisposes us to attribute a high order of intelligence to a creature capable of such an achievement and when it shams death on being disturbed we immediately pronounce it cunning 
the wildest conclusions are sometimes arrived at one author for instance states that he has seen an added spider instructing its young ones how to hunt and adds that whenever an old one missed its leap it would run from the place and hide itself in some crevice as if ashamed of its mismanagement such inferences of course were entirely unwarranted from the facts observed now the fact that a newly hatched garden spider can make a complete snare without ever having seen the operation performed immediately relegates that action to the realm of instinct not less wonderful than intelligence perhaps but certainly quite distinct from it with the much discussed origin of instinct we are not here concerned but a pure instinct differs from intelligence in this that it is due to inherited nervous mechanism and results in actions the object of which may be quite unknown to the actors there is no conscious adaptation of means to an end when a young spider spins a web there is not only no evidence that it does so with the deliberate purpose of catching flies but many known facts go to prove that it performs the feat because it feels as if it must and is quite ignorant of the purpose to be subserved it is no doubt quite beyond our power to ascertain accurately the mental condition of a spider but it is perfectly easy to make a few illuminating experiments on two points which have a very decided bearing on intelligence the development of the senses and the degree of what has been called educability or the power of learning from experience to what extent can the spider see hear smell feel taste how far is it capable of varying its action as the result of experience the senses as far as we know are the principal if not the only avenues by which external impressions can reach the seat of intelligence and there is no surer indication of the intelligence of an animal than the degree to which it is susceptible of education probably most readers know the immortal story of the pike cited by darwin in the descent of man the pike was in an aquarium separated by a sheet of glass from a tank in which were numerous small fish not till three months had expired did the pike cease to dash itself against the glass partition in its attempts to seize the fish in the neighboring tank it then desisted and had evidently learned something but what after three months the glass partition was removed but the pike refused to attack those particular fish though it immediately seized any new specimens introduced to the tank all that it had apparently learnt was that an attack on a particular fish resulted in a violent blow on the nose some degree of intelligence must be conceded to the pike but it can hardly be considered of a high order now the garden spider possesses eight eyes and might be expected to see fairly well but the experimenter will very soon come to the conclusion that the habitual use it makes of them at all events in daylight is very slight touch a web with a vibrating tuning fork and the spider will rush to the spot and investigate the instrument with its forelegs before distinguishing it from a fly remember however that this is only true of what are sometimes called sedentary spiders species which hunt their prey have much better vision yet even among sedentary spiders the power of sight is not negligible for a most trustworthy observer states that he has several times seen meta segmentata a very common small epirid drop from its web to secure an insect on the ground beneath 
and return with it by way of the drop line and the same action has been observed in the case of theridion which spins an irregular snare there are peculiar difficulties attending experiments on the subject of hearing an absolutely deaf person may be aware of the sounding of a deep organ note through the sense of feeling and a well-known experimenter was on the point of drawing interesting conclusions from the behavior of a spider in response to the notes of a flute when he found that precisely the same results were obtained by a soundless puff of air it seems hardly possible to make sure in the case of a spider in a snare that the sound vibrations are not felt apart from any sense of hearing and it is a remarkable fact that it is only the snare spinning spiders that make any response to sounds free roving spiders are apparently quite deaf in experimenting with sound we must take two precautions the instrument used must not necessitate any marked action which may be visible to the spider nor must it give rise to palpable air currents these requirements are best met by a tuning fork of not too low a pitch we cannot feel the air vibrations emanating from it but can only perceive them by the ear but we have no proof that the spider's sense of touch ceases precisely at the same point as our own however no better instrument for experiment seems to be available so we take a tuning fork and approach it cautiously in the quiescent state towards the spider stationed we will suppose in the center of its snare no notice is taken and we carefully withdraw it set it vibrating and approach it again in the same manner there is now generally a response the spider raising its front legs and extending them in the direction of the fork or if the sound is loud dropping suddenly by a thread and remaining suspended some inches below the snare the experiment should be repeated several times with the fork sometimes still sometimes vibrating and the conclusion arrived at will be that the spider is aware of the vibrating fork but by which sense it is noteworthy that a fork giving a low note is always most effective now here is a very remarkable fact in two widely different groups of spiders the theraphosidae or so-called bird-eating spiders and the therididae there are species with a stridulating or sound-making apparatus and we should hardly expect a deaf creature to evolve an elaborate mechanism for the production of sound this is a matter however that we shall discuss later no amount of research has succeeded in localizing the sense of hearing in spiders supposing it to exist the creature may lose any of its five pairs of limbs four pairs of legs and one pair of pedipalps without alteration in its response to sound if the front legs are missing the second pair are raised when the vibrating fork is approached it is fairly easy to test the sense of smell in these creatures the only necessary precaution being that no acid or pungent substances capable of having an irritating effect on the skin such as vinegar or ammonia must be employed such perfumes as lavender or heliotrope are free from this defect take a clean glass rod and present it to the spider as before and no notice is taken now dip it in oil of lavender allow it to dry and present it again most spiders respond to such a test appearance generally raising the abdomen and rubbing one or other of the legs against the jaws while jumping spiders generally raise the head and back away from the rod different essences produce different effects but there is seldom any doubt that the creature is aware of their presence it is not deficient in the sense of smell 
but its localization has hitherto baffled research the sense of taste does not seem to have been made the object of any definite experiments among spiders though such experiments might well lead to interesting conclusions and the reader might do worse than undertake some on his own account it would be easy for instance to supply a garden spider with various insects which are generally rejected by other insectivorous animals and to note its behavior it might refuse to have anything to do with them or it might sample them and turn away in disgust in the first case the explanation might be that it was warned of their probably evil taste by their coloration or smell but in any case here is an interesting little field for research it is the general belief among arachnologists that the sense of taste is well developed among spiders and it is highly improbable that a sense so necessary for the discrimination of suitable food should be lacking in animals with so respectable a sensory equipment there is no doubt at all that the sense of touch is extremely well developed in spiders especially perhaps in the sedentary groups and it is probable that under ordinary circumstances the garden spider works almost entirely by its guidance whether in the center of the web or in its retreat under a neighboring leaf it is in direct communication with every part of its snare by silken lines and the least disturbance usually suffices to bring it to the spot and then as we have said it will generally touch the disturbing object however unpromising in appearance before deciding on its line of action there is little doubt that many of the numerous hairs and bristles with which its limbs are furnished are distinctly sensory in function so much then as to the senses of spiders but what about their educability their power of learning from experience here is evidently a wide subject and a difficult one full of pitfalls for the unwary but we may nevertheless draw some inferences from the quite elementary experiments on the senses which have been outlined above a spider drops on account of the sounding of the tuning fork in its neighborhood can it be educated to take no notice of the sound after repeatedly finding that no evil consequences follow it will perhaps be most instructive to give in a condensed form the results of an actual experiment selected from many performed by two american arachnologists george and elizabeth peckham whose researches have thrown more light than any others upon the mental equipment of spiders they had an individual of the small appeared species cyclosa conica under observation for a month and tested it almost daily with the tuning fork at the sound of the fork the spider would drop when it had recovered itself and returned to the snare the fork would be sounded again and so on now on july twentieth the spider fell nine times successively the last three times only an inch or two and then took no further notice of the vibrating fork on subsequent days until august fifth she fell either five six or seven times except on two occasions when a day's test had been admitted and then eleven successive falls occurred before the spider ceased to respond on august fifth she seemed startled at the sound but did not fall though the fork was sounded nine times during the remainder of the experiment she generally remained perfectly indifferent to the fork though on one or two occasions she partially forgot her lesson and dropped a very short distance immediately recovering herself observe that the basis of educability is memory for a fortnight in the case of this particular spider the lesson learnt on one day seemed to be entirely forgotten the next morning but thereafter a definite change of habit seemed to result 
this does not appear a very great intellectual achievement but it is by no means despicable for it must be borne in mind that the habit of dropping when alarmed is almost the only means of defense such a spider possesses and the instinct which prompts it must be very strongly ingrained in the words of the experimenters taking this into consideration it seems remarkable that one of them should so soon have learned the sound of the vibrating fork and should have modified her action accordingly this single experiment has been here described in some detail largely for the purpose of impressing the reader with the importance of reducing the problem to its simplest terms before any inferences are drawn and it may well act as a model for any which he may be inclined to undertake on his own account the more complicated the action the more likely is the experimenter to read into it motives and mental operations which exist only in his own imagination and with this warning we must take leave of a subject which might tempt us to encroach too much on an allotted space End of chapter 4。5One North American species spins it in a horizontal position and then raises the center and, by an elaborate system of stay lines from above, converts it into a very accurately shaped dome. A whole group of orb weavers habitually decorate a sector of the snare with bands of flocculent silk, the object of which for a long time puzzled arachnologists. Till it was observed that the spider drew upon this reserved supply of material to wrap up particularly obstreperous insects. It is not unusual for a spider of one of the common species to remove a whole sector of the snare, and by stretching a line from the center to a place of retreat along the gap thus formed, to provide an unencumbered avenue between its home and its post when on duty for it must not be forgotten that a spider has to walk warily on its own web and must avoid as far as possible treading on the adhesive lines or delay and damage to the structure are sure to ensue as a rule the circular snares of the different british species are of a very uniform pattern differing chiefly in the degree of neatness with which they are constructed and in certain minor details of the hub but we have one spider hyptiotes paradoxus an exceedingly rare species scarcely ever seen beyond the limits of the new forest which makes such a strange snare that it seems a pity to omit all mention of it it consists of a sector about one-sixth of the full circle comprising about four radii with cross lines from the point where the radii meet a trap line connects the sector to another point of attachment on or rather under this trap line the spider takes up its position hauling it in so as to tighten the web and to leave a slack portion of the line between the points where it holds on by its front and hind legs when an insect impinges on the web and causes it to tremble the spider immediately lets go with its forelegs and the consequent vibration of the web helps to entangle its prey the circular snare is the highest form of spinning work attained by spiders and there is little temptation to expend much time in studying the cruder structures that meet the eye everywhere but two other types are worth a brief notice 
examine any garden bush particularly a holly bush of which the rather rigid leaves provide excellent points of support and you will find numberless small webs made without any discoverable method the lines crossing one another at random in all directions these are the snares of some species of theridion and if the webs lack interest the spiders themselves are worth looking at for they are nearly always quite prettily ornamented the other common type of snare is that of linifia it is larger and of more definite design consisting of a finely spun hammock stretched horizontally and surmounted by a labyrinth of irregular lines flies entangled in the labyrinth fall upon the hammock in their struggles to escape and the spider is at hand always on the under surface of the hammock to ensure their capture having noted these three common types of snare let us leave the garden and choose a new field for our observations if it is an absolutely calm sunny october morning it will be a suitable occasion for visiting an iron railing the knobbier the better early summer will do but late autumn is generally more fruitful almost any railing will serve but the most satisfactory kind is one with the uprights surmounted by round knobs and not by spikes we see at once that the knobs and the upper rail are glistening with silken lines many spiders have obviously been at work there lines streak the top rail in all directions stretch from knob to rail or from knob to knob if not too distant while here and there loose ends or streamers flutter gently in the slight currents of air and closer inspection reveals various small objects moving among this labyrinth of threads most of them are spiders though insects and particularly weevils are not wanting no doubt the weevils know their own business though the writer has not been taken into their confidence but the spiders are the particular object of our investigation and first of all note that it is a veritable race congress of spiders the most varied groups are represented wolf spiders lycosidae which under ordinary circumstances rarely leave the ground are found in company with crab spiders thomisidae jumping spiders atidae as well as apiridae and thrididae of which we already know something they have only one thing in common they are either small species or small and immature specimens of larger species they seem to be scrambling about in a meaningless sort of way paying little or no attention to each other which is odd for spiders are terrible cannibals and as a general thing it would be exceedingly unsafe for a small spider to rub shoulders with a larger one of a different species the majority of them are very small more or less black theridid spiders the micros of the tribe and their proper home is among the roots of grass and herbage many of these are interesting objects for the microscope especially if males because of the remarkable protuberances or turrets which rise from their heads and bear their eyes as on a watchtower these spiders are clearly not out for food they have left their ordinary beat for quite another purpose and we shall probably not have to wait long before discovering it some one of the group ceases its apparently purposeless wandering and turning its head in the direction of what slight wind there is raises its forebody to the full extent of its straightened legs and elevates its abdomen to the utmost now watch closely using a hand glass if you have one 
and you will see streamers of silk proceeding from its spinnerets. They are shot out for a short distance, and then the air current draws them out further till they often extend for several feet, though their extreme fineness makes it almost impossible to form an accurate judgment of their length. Meanwhile, the spider has not merely been standing on its toes, it has been firmly gripping the silken lines on the railings with its claws. Soon it feels the pull of the streaming threads, and when the tension is sufficient, it lets go with all its claws simultaneously, vaults into the air, and sails away. Sometimes a start is made prematurely, and the insufficient buoyancy of the streamers causes the spider to descend almost at once, and a new start is made. This, then, is the habitual method by which new broods of spiders distribute themselves, especially the sedentary kinds which would otherwise soon become overcrowded in the neighborhood of the parent nest. And we really need not have sought out a railing at all, except for its very great convenience of observation. The same thing is going on everywhere. It largely accounts for the astonishing carpet of silk that the dew reveals to us on lawns and meadows at such times of the year. Young spiders have been busy from early dawn, crawling over the grass, climbing the higher blades, and setting sail, and the whole field is covered with their lines. Railings come in handy as furnishing a elevated starting point, but any shrub or bush will do, and young spiders have been seen setting sail from the parent web itself. McCook has given some interesting notes of his own observations on aeronautic spiders. He followed an added spider fifty feet till it was carried upward out of sight in a current of air. A lycosid disappeared in the same way after being followed at a run for a hundred feet. The largest appearance he ever saw taking flight was the size of a marrow fat pea, say one fourth of an inch long. After having floated over a field and above a hedgerow, it crossed a road and anchored upon the top of a young tree. But perhaps his most interesting observation was on the ability of spiders to control, in some measure, the duration of their flight by reefing their sails if they wish to descend, for he saw a ballooning spider collecting some of the streamers into a ball of silk which accumulated near its mouth as it gradually sank to earth. The phenomenon known as gossamer has puzzled people for centuries, and English poetical literature is full of allusions to it. Chaucer classes it with ebb and flow as an unsolved riddle, and Spencer, Quarles, and Thompson all make mention of it, generally embodying the popular belief that it somehow had its origin in dew. Scorched dew, Spencer calls it, while Thompson's expression is do evaporate. The phenomenon in question is the occasional appearance of vast numbers of silken flakes which fill the air, and which in some recorded instances extend over many square miles into a height of several hundred feet. Our observations will have given a clue to its origin, which is entirely attributable to spiders and in large measure to their ballooning habit, though no doubt reinforced by a large quantity of silk spun for other purposes and caught up into the air by the breeze. For a vivid account of such a shower, the reader is referred to letter 15 of White's Natural History of Selborne, and Darwin, in his Naturalist's Voyage, Chapter 8, records a case of the gossamer spider descending in multitudes on the beagle when sixty miles from land. In the ballooning habit we have the probable explanation of the wide distribution of certain species of spiders 
which seem at first exceedingly ill adapted for covering large distances the huntsman spider heteropoda venatorius is practically cosmopolitan in tropical and subtropical regions and the usual view has been that ships have conveyed it from port to port mccook however gives several reasons for believing that the trade winds have much more to do with the matter and this may well be the case though both agencies have doubtless been at work very likely it was not obvious to the reader why he was recommended to select a particularly calm sunny autumn day for his study of spider aeronautics a strong steady breeze might well appear more suitable for the purpose yet he would find these operations at a standstill on a windy day and the best possible conditions are a still warm morning after a spell of cooler weather the lightest air currents serve to float the delicate silken threads and what is more important the increase of temperature causes an upward draft which rapidly carries the spider to a useful height where it sails gently away instead of being swept roughly over the surface of the ground end of chapter five Chapter Six of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Agelina. Before going further afield, let us investigate one of the spinners of the sheet webs that are so unpleasantly familiar in the house. We object to them on very obvious grounds, first, as evidence of neglect and bad housewifery and secondly as repulsive objects when covered by accumulations of dust which their firm texture and their durability make inevitable the common house spiders belong to the family agelinidae it is quite likely that their original home was in a warmer climate where they lived out of doors but that was long ago and now they uniformly select buildings of some sort for their operations they have however even in this country several open-air cousins and most people know the great sheet web spider of the hedgerows though its name agelina labyrinthica may be new to them its web consists of a closely woven wide-spreading sheet connected with a tube of even denser material in the mouth of which the spider may generally be seen lurking a rather sinister object if a better view of the animal is desired it is only necessary to agitate the web slightly and the spider runs forward to investigate it is a large species as british spiders go about three quarters of an inch in length with the abdomen rather prettily marked with oblique white streaks it is very unlike our garden spider in certain points of structure its body is more elongate and rather rigid with little play of action between the cephalothorax and the abdomen its legs are notably long and so are two of its spinnerets which can be seen protruding beyond the abdomen as we look down upon it but we shall gain little information by looking at the completed web and our best plan is to take the animal home and observe it in captivity we have prepared for its reception a box about a foot square with a gauze top and a movable glass front it is not such an easy matter to secure the spider which can run like a lamplighter and which has a way of escape at the lower end of its tube the safest way is suddenly to shut off this means of retreat with the finger and thumb of the left hand and simultaneously to present a glass vial at the mouth of the tube the spider runs up into it and is taken without the risk of injury it is never advisable to handle spiders not because any british species is formidable but because they so readily part with their limbs in order to escape 
and the chances are that only a mutilated specimen will be obtained now agelina does not seem to be a particularly engaging pet but it has its points in the first place it very quickly makes itself at home a short time is spent in exploring its new quarters but it adapts itself almost at once to its changed situation moreover it is of a peaceable and domestic disposition and the male and female live amicably together which is far from being the case among the apiridae whose peculiar marital relations are often quite wrongly attributed to the whole tribe of spiders a male garden spider courts the female at the risk of his life and it is not surprising that he should evince great hesitation and caution in his advances if his attentions are unwelcome or even if they have been accepted he will be promptly trussed up and eaten unless he beats a hasty retreat but with agelina the conjugal relations are exemplary and harmony reigns in the home the question of food is certainly a difficulty but if insects are let loose in the cage the spider will attend to the catching of them in some cases raw meat has been found a satisfactory substitute after a brief exploration of the box the captive soon becomes busy going to and fro across its cage and attaching lines to the sides at some height up from the floor so fine is the work that for a long time hardly anything is visible and the movements of the animal are the only clue to what is taking place by and by it becomes evident that a sort of skeleton platform has been spun across the box upon which the spider is able to walk it is continually strengthened by new threads and braced by stay lines above and below it has been hardly possible to follow the operations by which this has come about and even now we are chiefly aware of the existence of the platform because we see the spider walking upon it its movements seemed very scrambling and unmethodical but they have resulted in the foundation of the sheet web and its terminal tube but now it begins to behave quite differently and another phase of the work has clearly begun it crawls about over the almost invisible foundation lines with a most curious gait using its long legs to sway its body from side to side raising and depressing its abdomen at intervals and as this motion continues a beautiful gauzy sheet of incredibly fine texture gradually grows into view what is happening is that the spider is strewing over the foundation lines multitudinous threads from its long posterior spinnerets which are beset on their under surface with numbers of hair-like spinning tubes from each of which the silk is issuing all day long the process goes on and by slow degrees the web increases in density indeed for days after the structure is complete the spider spends odd moments in going over the ground again till the sheet and especially the tube proceeding from it to a corner of the box are so closely woven as to have become almost opaque and its occupant at length appears to be satisfied with his handiwork and retires into the tube to wait patiently for casual visitors july is a good month in which to experiment with agelina for if the captives include female specimens some further spinning operations of a very complicated description may be observed the time of egg-laying is at hand and elaborate preparations have to be made but if the experimenter wishes to see the whole process he must be prepared to sacrifice his night's rest for the most critical part of the performance takes place in the small hours of the morning we will describe what occurred in the case of one agelina 
the approaching of a position was heralded several hours beforehand by the animal commencing to weave a hammock-like compartment from the roof of the box and above the sheet web this chamber was about four inches long and was constructed precisely in the same manner as the sheet to which it was braced by lines from various points of its under surface its construction occupied the whole day previous to the laying of the eggs and not until half an hour before midnight was it completed within this compartment close to the roof the spider next wove a small sheet one inch long working diligently in an inverted position ventral surface upwards after a quarter of an hour it rested for an equal space apparently exhausted by its prolonged efforts an hour and three quarters intermittent work served to complete the sheet the spider varying the monotony of its sinuous walk round this small area by occasionally walking over it and strengthening the lines which attached its angles to the roof a marked change now became observable in the manner of working the animal abandoned its incessant to and fro motion but began to jerk its body up towards the sheet throwing silk strongly against it at the same time the posterior spinnerets were actively rubbed together and the long posterior spinnerets separated and brought together again in a scissor-like action the result of this performance was to invest the under surface of the small sheet with a coating of flossy silk quite unlike the ordinary web in texture the purpose of which soon became evident for at about a quarter past two the spider began to deposit its eggs upwards against this loose textured silk aiding the egg mass to adhere by occasional upward jerks of the body this occupied between five and ten minutes and as soon as it was accomplished the under surface of the egg mass was covered by a layer of flossy silk similar to that against which it was laid the eggs being thus entirely enveloped in a coating of soft loose textured material this was next covered in by a sheet of firm texture like that of the original web it might be supposed that the work was at length finished and that a well-earned rest might be enjoyed but this was far from being the case the spider remained as active as ever though an hour or two passed before the object of its industry was evident all this time it was incessantly climbing backwards and forwards between the egg sheet and the hammock and generally scrimmaging round in the most unaccountable way but it gradually became evident that the eggs were being enclosed in a wonderful transparent box of filmy silk with the egg-bearing sheet for its roof by nine o'clock it was of moderate strength and opacity and the spider having worked the clock round no longer labored continuously days elapsed however before it was entirely finished to the satisfaction of the spider which remained all the time in close proximity to the box and could with difficulty be frightened away but clung tenaciously to it when interfered with now this remarkable performance which any reader endowed with sufficient patience may observe for himself gives food for thought the spider has never seen a cocoon constructed and has no model to work by and yet it performs with absolute precision all the stages in their proper succession of a work which involves quite a number of different spinning operations nor does the absence of light by which to work trouble it in the slightest it seems hard to believe that this is not a sign of high intelligence and that the spider is probably quite unconscious of the object for which it has labored so long and so aptly but how otherwise explain this curious fact if the eggs are removed the moment they are laid 
the work is continued precisely as if they were still there the box is laboriously built round the place where they ought to be and the spider refuses to budge from the empty casket though there is no longer any treasure to guard clearly as the egg-laying time approaches the spider feels an irresistible blind impulse to perform in a definite order certain complicated actions it is like a machine actuated by an internal spring and in the spider's case the internal spring is the inherited nervous mechanism we call instinct which urges it to actions which it is not in the least necessary that it should understand end of chapter six chapter seven of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain water spiders here is the place to insert a short account of some near relations of agelina which we shall certainly not meet in our walk but of which the mode of life is too interesting to be altogether passed over in silence we have seen that the class crustacea crabs shrimps etc is the great division of the arthropoda entirely adapted to an aquatic life breathing by means of gills the air which is dissolved in the water insects and spiders are air breathing and properly belong to the land yet there are many insects which pass their early stages often the greater portion of their life in the water and some which are very fairly at home there when adult such insects often have gills when young and are therefore at that period true water animals like the crustacea the arachnida that division of the arthropoda to which the spiders belong include a few groups which permanently inhabit the sea and could not live on land there are even some weird creatures called sea spiders pycnogonids but these do not concern us for they are very far removed from the true spiders which are the subject of our investigations now the true spiders are always air breathing and if they venture into the water at all they must frequently come up to the surface to breathe or else they must store up a reservoir of air beneath the surface of the water if they are to avoid death by drowning nevertheless some of them have been hardy enough to encroach on the domain of the crustacea not a few are able to run freely on the surface of the water and even to dive occasionally for the purpose of seizing one of its denizens but the number of those which have succeeded in really adapting themselves to aquatic life is very limited and is as far as we know restricted to two small groups both of them members of the agelina day among the coral reefs of the indian and pacific oceans and also off the southern coast of africa there are found spiders of the genus desis which spend almost all their time under the surface of the sea from which they only emerge at low tide they construct very closely woven tents impermeable to sea water which imprison air at low tide generally choosing for the purpose some cavity which has been excavated by one of the burrowing mollusks beyond this we really know very little about them and there is much difference of opinion as to the mode in which they obtain their food some writers state that they only leave their shelters at low tide to chase small crustaceans and that when placed in vessels containing sea water they are quite helpless and soon drown on the other hand one observer found that a species of desis was quite at home in a sea water tank in which it swam freely and even attacked and fed upon a small fish 
possibly different species of the genus behave in different ways some being more truly aquatic than others though it is certain that the troubled waters of a coral sea are not a very promising field for subaqueous operations we know a great deal more of the mode of life of those agilinids which have taken to living in fresh water indeed the subject of the water spider Argyronetta aquatica is so hackneyed that in dealing with it we shall probably be telling the reader much of what he knows already but that possibility must be risked there is then in many of our lakes ponds and slow flowing rivers with a weedy bed a spider which has entirely taken to a water life and for which it is useless to search on land it is a docile captive and consequently a favorite subject for transference to an aquarium where its habits can be observed at leisure its first care is to construct beneath the water a small dome-shaped web open below and it generally selects the under surface of the leaf of a water weed for the purpose of anchorage though a ready-made shelter is often furnished by the empty shell of some fresh water mollusk its next proceeding is to fill this retreat with air in a very ingenious manner while swimming about in the water the spider has a most striking appearance its abdomen almost resembling a globe of quicksilver this is because the body is enveloped in a bubble of air retained largely by the long hairs with which it is clothed thus it carries its atmosphere about with it and as often as not it swims with its back downwards which has the effect of bringing the bulk of the air bubble towards its ventral surface where the breathing pores are situated now when the dome-shaped web is ready to be filled with air the spider rises to the surface lifts its abdomen above it and brings it down with a flop thus imprisoning an extra large air bubble which it embraces with its hind legs by way of holding it more securely and then swimming rapidly down by means of its other legs to the web it discharges its load of air beneath the downwardly directed mouth of the dome by a frequent repetition of this process the dome is at length filled and converted into a veritable diving bell in which the spider can exist quite comfortably until the supply of oxygen in the imprisoned air is exhausted and has to be renewed from this base it issues forth to feed upon freshwater insects and crustaceans sometimes even attacking small fishes the proceedings of the male argyronetta in the mating season are very curious he seeks out the tent of a female and sets up his own establishment generally somewhat smaller close at hand filling it with air in the approved manner he then builds a sort of corridor uniting the two domes and when this is complete he bites through the female dome thus uniting the two air reservoirs by means of a connecting tube not seldom it happens that the female is in no mood for dalliance and a battle royal ensues with disastrous results to both domiciles and the tube that connects them the male however is in this case well able to hold his own for he is larger than the female a phenomenon elsewhere unknown in the spider realm argyronetta lives for some years and makes two diving bells each year one near the surface in summer and one at a greater depth in winter it was thought at first that one was constructed especially for receiving the eggs and the other as a habitation but the egg cocoon may be found in either for there are two broods in the course of the year the winter dome is of very dense silk glossy in appearance and giving the effect of a uniform sheet of silky material rather than a fabric 
moreover its mouth is closed and the spider remains inactive within it is this winter domicile that is most frequently found in the shells of mollusks the egg cocoon is also dome-shaped having a convex upper and a flat under surface the newly hatched young inhabit their mother's tent for a time and then set forth in the water to seek their living and set up establishments on their own account there is only one known species of argyronetta widely distributed in the temperate regions of europe and asia the female is about half an inch long of no particular beauty out of the water its color being reddish brown and its body and legs very hairy there are however a few new zealand spiders rather closely allied to it and of very similar habits end of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Crab Spiders Mimicry. All spiders can spin, but by no means all use that power to entrap their prey. Many have no settled abode or resting place, except perhaps for a short time when they are rearing their young among these roving tribes there are three groups which may engage our attention for a time the crab spiders Phamicidae, the wolf spiders lycosidae and the jumping spiders atidae crab spiders are seldom seen by the ordinary observer for their habits do not bring them prominently into notice and many of them are of small size they are well named for there is something exceedingly crab-like in their appearance and in their actions their body is generally broad and flattened and their legs instead of being arranged fore and aft like those of most spiders extend more or less laterally and though they can move pretty actively in any direction their normal method of progression is sidewise then again, when frightened, they cramp their legs up under their bodies in a most crab-like fashion and sham dead. We saw some of these spiders on the iron railing, but their real haunts are among grass and herbage or upon the trunks of trees. Some are true rovers, hunting their prey by day and camping out wherever they happen to find themselves at night. Their methods are without guile, except that they approach their victims warily. Their trust is in rapidity of action and superior strength. But other crab spiders lead a less strenuous life. Their habit is to lurk in moss, lichen, or flowers till an insect draws near enough to be seized without any great expenditure of energy now in the case of some of these spiders the chance of obtaining a meal is very greatly increased by a remarkable similarity of coloration between the spider and its usual hunting ground the spider's object is to remain invisible and concealment is obviously more easy if its color matches that of its environment to a greater or lesser extent this protective coloration as it is called prevails universally spiders are seldom conspicuous objects among their usual surroundings but it is only occasionally that we meet with cases of very remarkable color adaptation two such however occur among english crab spiders one is a species not uncommon in the south of england and fairly plentiful in the new forest where it is to be sought among the lichen on the tree trunks where its blue-gray body marked with black and white blotches makes it practically invisible except when in motion it rejoices in the name of philodromus margaritatus the other case is that of the spider known as misumena vatia which is variable in color 
some specimens being yellow and others pink, while a variety of the species has a blood-red streak decorating the front part of its abdomen. If it were to choose lichen as a hunting ground, there would be little chance of concealment, but it does nothing so foolish. It hides among the petals of flowers, generally but not always among flowers more or less of its own color. Now, this phenomenon of resemblance is sometimes carried very much further than a tolerable correspondence between the color of an animal and its surroundings. It occasionally amounts to an apparent imitation, in form and in behavior, as well as in color, of some other object, either animal or vegetable, and in such cases we have examples of what is known as mimicry. Most people have seen remarkable instances of this phenomenon in the stick and leaf insects of entomological collections. There are several different ways in which such a resemblance may be profitable to the imitator. Clearly, it may be advantageous for a weak animal to be mistaken for one much more formidable and less likely to be attacked, or for an insect which is really extremely good eating to resemble closely one which birds well know to be unpalatable, or again, if your line is to lie perdu and wait for some unwary insect to come within reach, it must be a distinct asset to be indistinguishable from such an innocent object as a twig or a leaf, and the same disguise may serve you if you are the possible victim, and you can make the would-be devourer believe that you are a mere vegetable. It is seldom difficult to see some such possibility of gain in the numerous well-known cases of insect mimicry. The wasp tribe, formidable with their stings, are often mimicked. The unpalatable heliconid butterflies are imitated by members of edible families, and some insects are such exact imitations of leaves that the all-devouring army ants have been seen to run over them without discovering the imposition. Mimicry is an unfortunate term inasmuch as it seems to imply intentional imitation. Protective resemblance is better. It is generally accounted for by the action of natural selection upon random variations. No two members of a brood are exactly alike. Slight variations in form, size, color, etc. are constantly occurring, and when the variation is a useful one, the animal possessing it has a slightly better chance of surviving and rearing progeny, some of whom will, probably, possess the same peculiarity, perhaps even in a more marked degree, and will be better equipped than their neighbors in the struggle for life. The happy possessors of such favorable variations are thus, in a sense, selected by nature, and this selection, acting through countless generations, is thought to be the chief agent in bringing about the remarkable phenomenon of protective resemblance. The theory has, no doubt, been pushed too far. Fanciful resemblances have been detected and advantages of which there is no proof are sometimes asserted, and moreover other possible ways of accounting for the facts have been too much overlooked. But however, it has come about, there is a case of mimicry among crab spiders which deserves more than a passing mention. The name of the spider in question is Phyronachne decipiens, and it was accidentally discovered by Forbes when butterfly hunting in Java. It spins a white patch of silk on the upper side of a leaf on which it places itself back downwards, clinging to the web by means of spines on its legs. It then folds its legs closely and lies absolutely still. In this position, the spider and web look precisely like the droppings of some bird upon the leaf 
such droppings are frequently seen and seem to be particularly attractive to butterflies it was not until forbes tried to catch a butterfly settled on a leaf that he found that what looked like excrement was really a spider which held the butterfly in its grasp even after this experience he was again deceived by the same species in sumatra there are several extremely ant-like spiders and it is remarkable that some of the imitators belong to widely different spider families that is to say the resemblance has arisen independently from quite different starting points it is very noteworthy that resemblance in structure is always accompanied by similarity of behavior as indeed it is bound to be if any benefit is to accrue to the mimic your resemblance to a leaf will deceive no one if you run wildly about and your imitation of an ant will lack verisimilitude if you adopt a slow and stately method of progression ant-like spiders adopt the hurried and apparently undecided gait of their models and insects which look like sticks leaves or inanimate objects all possess the power and the habit of remaining for a long time perfectly motionless End of chapter 8chapter nine of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain wolf spiders of the groups of wandering spiders which spin no snare but trust to speed and agility for their food the lycosidae or wolf spiders supply the best subjects for study to begin with they are very numerous at certain times of the year some species absolutely swarming in woods during may and june among the leaves which fell in the previous autumn during the summer months they are still in evidence but as winter approaches they rapidly disappear the swift motion and predaceous habits have earned them the name of wolf spiders but though they sometimes occur in incredible numbers so that it seems impossible to avoid treading upon them they do not hunt in packs each one is entirely concerned with his own individual quarry they are moderate sized or large spiders commonly about half an inch long in this country though there are exotic species which attain an inch and a quarter and in build they are very unlike the garden spider being elongate and with the abdomen nothing like so globular their habits vary considerably one genus appropriately named pirata is semi-aquatic living at the margins of rivers and ponds and able to run on the surface of the water but most of the lycosidae prefer dry land the drier the better heaths sand hills bare and stony stretches of soil even deserts are fertile in examples of this group most of the smaller species love the sunlight and it is often noticeable on a bright day when the ground seems to be alive with wolf spiders that a chance cloud obscuring the sun will cause them to disappear as if by magic some of the small lycosids seem to be absolute wanderers having no home at all but spending the night under a stone or any casual shelter while others dig a more or less temporary hole in the ground into which they carry their captured prey and in which they take refuge on the appearance of an enemy the large wolf spiders have permanent burrows from which they do not wander far and in the mouths of which they spend most of their time on the lookout for passing insects let us first catch one of the small wolf spiders and examine it this is not a very simple operation with creatures which can run so swiftly 
but after a few attempts we induce a specimen to run up into a glass tube held in the line of its course we see it to be a long-bodied spider thickly beset with hairs which entirely hide the integument of the abdomen its general hue will probably be a dark gray and its abdomen will be decorated by a more or less distinct pattern due not as in the garden spider to pigments in the skin but to the coloration of the hairs but look particularly at its eyes a pocket lens will suffice to reveal that two of them are much larger and much more businesslike in appearance than anything apira had to show these are directed forwards being placed at the upper angles of the perpendicular front face so to speak of the animal below them just above the jaws are four small eyes in a transverse row and behind them at some distance on the upper surface of the cephalothorax are yet another pair of moderate size in some groups of spiders the eyes are not only small but have an indefinite dull ineffectual appearance here they are clear-cut glossy and convex sight apparently counts for something in the case of the lycosidae and this is what we should expect a sedentary spider is informed of the whereabouts of its prey by the sense of touch through the trembling of the web but a wolf spider spins no web and is dependent on the keenness of its vision there is a very prettily marked english lycosid which is very often found on sand hills in situations particularly convenient for observation its name is lycosa picta and it is incidentally interesting as affording a good example of protective coloration for the sand hill variety is light colored and very inconspicuous when stationary on the sand while an inland variety not uncommon in the dark soil of heaths is of a much darker hue carefully scrutinizing the firmer sand of the dunes on a sunny june day I detect a number of small holes the burrows of a colony of these spiders and approaching cautiously i establish myself at full length at a distance of a yard or so on the side away from the sun in such an attitude that i can observe closely for a considerable time without too much discomfort the minutes pass and nothing happens but i know that the cardinal virtue of the naturalist is patience and i wait presently the dark circle of one of the burrows is obliterated it is filled by the sand-colored head of the spider coming up to prospect other heads appear and soon one spider bolder than the rest emerges bodily and remains for a minute motionless on the qui vive finding no cause for alarm it presently begins moving about stealthily and before long several members of the colony are busily exploring the neighborhood a cloud passes over the sun and all quickly disappear into their holes but this time without alarm for they come forth unhesitatingly when the sun shines again it is a fascinating sight to observe these little creatures pursuing their operations in absolute silence under my very eyes a few stealthy steps are taken the body being so moved that the battery of eyes is brought to bear upon different points of the compass a short quick run ensues followed by more cautious movements i am not fortunate enough to see the actual running down of a quarry but in time I note one of the colony bringing home an insect in its jaws. So absorbed am I that I fairly jump when a horrified human voice close at hand observes, He's in a fit. I have excited the solicitude of a girl's school which has approached noiselessly over the sand on their afternoon promenade and stands gazing at me with as much fascination as i at the spiders 
I hasten to reassure them, but the spell is broken, and the seance is at an end. Not a spider is visible. But I can still do one thing. Here is a good opportunity of finding out something about the burrows of these spiders. In turf, the investigation would be difficult, but it is easy to operate in the tolerably firm sand where the colony has established itself. I insert a straw into one of the burrows as a guide to the exploration, and with a knife carefully begin to remove the sand immediately round it. It is lined, I find, by a very delicate and slight coating of silk, no more than sufficient to keep the sand particles of its walls from falling down into the tube. I go down for an inch and a half or so and find that the tube ends blindly in a sort of silk-lined pocket, but no spider is there. This is mysterious, for I am pretty sure that my spiders are at home. I go to work upon another burrow, but this time in a different way, digging it out bodily with its surrounding sand and placing it on a sheet of paper, with which I am luckily provided for a detailed examination. I can now approach it from the side, and by carefully removing the sand, lay bare the whole silken tube. As before, there is a straight perpendicular burrow ending blindly and uninhabited, but at a point at about halfway down the tube, I find a branch bending upward so that the whole tunnel is Y-shaped, and at the blind end of this branch, I find the spider. This observation suggests that the tunnels of some of our English wolf spiders may be more complex than was imagined. At present, nothing is known of their nature in the case of other species. A little later in the summer, the appearance of a troop of wolf spiders has undergone a marked change. Almost every individual will be found burdened with a circular bag of eggs attached firmly to its spinnerets and carried about with it in all its wanderings. The cocoon is worth examination. It is a rather flattened sphere with an equatorial line round it, giving the effect of two valves, an upper and a lower. The operation of making it has very seldom been observed because it takes place in a closed retreat constructed for the purpose. McCook was fortunate enough to see something of it in the case of a captive Lycosa, which he kept in a glass jar partly filled with soil. Luckily, the spider dug its tunnel for cocooning purposes up against the side of the jar so that its interior was visible. It was about an inch deep and fairly wide, and its aperture was closed with silk. Against the perpendicular wall of soil, a circular silken cushion, about three-quarters of an inch in diameter, was spun, and the eggs deposited in the center. The edges of the cushion were then gathered up and pulled over the eggs, and the bag thus formed was finished off with an external layer of spinning work on the two halves of the sphere, the seam, or equator, being left thin for the exit of the young spiders. The Lycosa then attached the cocoon to its spinnerets and proceeded to bite away the silken sheet which sealed the burrow. The whole operation lasted about four and a half hours. Thenceforward, till the young are hatched, the wolf spider never quits her egg bag, which she carries about on all her expeditions, attached by threads to the spinnerets. Garden spiders die soon after laying their eggs and never see their progeny. But here we have a case of maternal solicitude persisting for many days, and the Peckhams seized upon it as a good subject for investigating the subject of the memory of spiders. If the cocoon were removed from the spinnerets, after how long an interval would it be recognized by the mother? 
a pirata was selected for experiment it offered great resistance to the removal of the cocoon seizing it with its jaws and trying to escape with it when it had been taken away the mother displayed great uneasiness searching for it in all directions it was returned to her after an hour and a half when she received it eagerly and immediately attached it in the usual position from three others of the same species the cocoons were removed and restored after thirteen fourteen and a half and sixteen hours respectively all remembered them and took them back immediately but twenty-four hours seemed to be the extreme limit of their memory after that interval two of the mothers refused to have anything to do with their cocoons while the third only resumed hers slowly and without any enthusiasm after it had been placed before her seven times in succession some other species seemed to possess a rather longer memory but the experimenters found no lycosid constant in her affection for so long a period as forty-eight hours we have said that lycosid spiders see comparatively well yet if they are placed within an inch or two of their cocoons they may be quite a long time finding them this is very puzzling until it is considered that its habitual position is such that the spider never sees it she never has seen it since its construction and does not in the least recognize it by sight spiders of other groups where the female remains near but detached from the cocoon are not at the same disadvantage and if the cocoon is removed to a short distance the mother will go straight to it and bring it back the wolf spider only knows the feel of the cocoon she may pass close by it without recognition but as soon as she touches it the cocoon is immediately resumed if the interval of separation has not been too great but is it necessary to restore to the spider her own cocoon will not that of another spider serve as well certainly it will a wolf spider will eagerly adopt the cocoon of a spider even belonging to a different genus if not greatly unlike her own in size nay even a ball of pith of the same size will be attached with alacrity to the spinnerets though if offered a choice between a cocoon and a pith ball the spider after some hesitation selects the real article one spider even accepted a cocoon into which a leaden shot had been inserted making it many times its original weight she could hardly crawl with her new burden but stuck to it gallantly and when several efforts to secure it to her spinnerets had proved ineffectual she carried it about between her jaws and the third pair of legs again we find the intelligence of the spider distinctly limited but its powerful instincts are equal to all ordinary requirements nature does not as a rule play extravagant pranks such as interchanging cocoons or substituting for them pith balls and leaden pellets the famous tarantula is a wolf spider though in america unfortunately the name has been quite wrongly applied to the members of an entirely different group everyone has heard of its deadly repute and of the myth that its bite can only be cured by the wild tarantula dance or tarantella it is one of the large lycosids of southern europe these as we have said are much less nomadic than the smaller species but have a permanent home from which they do not wander far afield they prefer waste arid places and their burrows are simply cylindrical tubes with the upper portion lined by silk the mouth being often surmounted by a sort of rampart of particles of soil mingled with small pieces of wood collected in the neighborhood the spider lurks in the mouth of the tube where its glistening eyes can be distinctly seen if an insect ventures near 
it rushes out and secures it. If alarmed, it retreats instantly to the bottom of the burrow. That most fascinating of all entomological writers, J. H. Fabre, made some observations on a tarantula of southern France, which well deserve attention. Colonies of the spider were numerous in his neighborhood, and he set himself to procure some specimens. Old writers assert that if a straw be inserted into the burrow, the spider will seize it and hold it so firmly that it may be drawn forth. Fabre found this method exciting, but uncertain in its results. Another plan which had been advocated was to approach warily and cut off the retreat of a spider by plunging the blade of a knife into the soil below it and so cutting off its retreat but this required very rapid action and was moreover apt to be prevented by the presence of stones in the soil he devised a new scheme he provided himself with a number of bumblebees in narrow glass tubes about the width of the spider burrows repairing to a tarantula colony he would present the open end of the tube to the mouth of a burrow the liberated bee seeing a hole in the ground exactly suitable for its own purposes would enter it with very little hesitation there would be a loud buzz and then instant silence inserting a pair of forceps into the hole fabre would then withdraw the bee with the spider clinging tenaciously to it in all cases the death of the bee was instantaneous though the closest examination of its dead body revealed no wound now fabre was fresh from his wonderful studies of the habits of the solitary wasps which provide their young with insects stung in such a way as to cause paralysis but not death in their case the problem was to secure food for their larvae which should remain fresh for many days an instinct taught them to solve it in the most remarkable manner the problem of the spider was different it was a case of killing instantly or being killed a merely wounded bee is as formidable as one unharmed what fabre desired to know was this did the spider trust to one invariable deadly stroke in dealing with the bee as the solitary wasp according to its species had been found to act always precisely in the same way in paralyzing its victim to settle this point the spider must be seen at work and the obvious plan seemed to be to enclose a bee and a tarantula in a glass vessel and see what would happen but nothing happened at all the spider away from its burrow refused to attack the equally matched antagonists treated each other with the greatest respect and only evinced a desire to keep as far apart as possible even when placed in the same tube both acted on the defensive and no light was thrown on the problem but fabre's ingenuity was equal to the occasion it occurred to him that to use as bait an insect of burrowing habits had been a tactical error. If, instead of a bumblebee, some other insect, equally formidable, but not attracted by holes in the ground, were selected for the purpose, the spider might be induced to rush forth and reveal its method of attack. A large carpenter bee, Xylocopa, was chosen and the mouth of the tube containing it was presented as before to the mouth of the tarantula tunnel. The insect showed no disposition to enter the tunnel, but buzzed in the tube outside. Many burrows were tested before any luck attended the investigator, but at length a spider responded. There was a fierce rush, a clinch, and the bee was dead. The operation was too rapid to follow, but the spider's fangs remained where they had struck, embedded just behind the insect's neck. The experiment was repeated until sufficient cases had been witnessed, 
to establish the fact that the tarantula dealt no random stroke but with unerring precision and lightning rapidity plunged its fangs into the vital spot fabre quaintly exclaims in french i was delighted by this murderer's knowledge i was compensated for my epidermis being roasted in the sun examples of the same species of tarantula kept in captivity threw further light on the habits of the group these large lycosids live for years and are at first wanderers on the face of the earth they do not settle down and burrow till the autumn just after they have attained maturity these young adults are only about half the size they will eventually attain but the burrows are enlarged at need so that it is customary to find tubes of two sizes those of the newly established small females and those of the fully grown females of two or more years old curiously enough if disturbed they entirely decline to burrow unless it be the proper season for that operation but remain inert and helpless on the surface till they die if however a tunnel is provided for them they enter it at once and adapt it to their needs the legs take no part in the burrowing process which is entirely carried out by the jaws with infinite labor small particles of earth are dislodged and carried by the mandibles to be dropped at a considerable distance from the nest the parapet round the mouth of the tube is in nature usually quite a small erection but this seems to be due to the fact that only a small amount of suitable material is available in the immediate neighborhood and the spiders will not go far afield in captivity where abundance of material was supplied they attained a height of two inches small stones sticks and strands of wool cut into lengths of one inch and of various colors were placed within reach and all were used in building the parapet comparatively large pebbles were rolled up for a foundation and fragments of earth and pieces of wool entirely irrespective of color were bound together by irregular spinning work on sunny days the spiders would crouch behind the parapet with their eyes above its level to distant insects they paid no attention but if one approached within leaping distance it was pounced upon with unfailing accuracy in due season the captives laid their eggs and enclosed them in the regulation cocoon which they attached to their spinnerets never parting from them thenceforward though considerably hampered by them in their movements up and down the tube but a very remarkable change now took place in their behavior at the mouth of the tunnel in sunny weather instead of remaining as fabre puts it accoudé on the parapet they reversed their position, raised their egg cocoons with their hind legs, and slowly and deliberately turned them about so that every part in succession should be exposed to the sun's rays. We now come to a remarkable habit possessed by all the Lycosidae. When the young are ready to leave the cocoon, they find an exit at the thinner equatorial seam and proceed immediately to climb on to the back of the mother clinging firmly to her covering of hairs if a wanderer she carries them thus on all her expeditions if a stay at home they accompany her up and down her tube they are often dislodged indeed when alarmed they scatter for the moment but when the peril has passed they immediately swarm up the maternal legs to their former position now in the case of the tarantula it is seven months before they are able to fend for themselves meanwhile they eat nothing and look on with indifference while their mother feeds she not only carries them willingly but exhibits solicitude when deprived of them but she shows no discrimination as to her own offspring and is quite content with those of another spider the young when brushed off climb the legs of the nearest female 
and a spider may thus be laden with thrice her proper load without any protest they form a layer two or three deep and can then only find room by covering the whole of her back they nevertheless take care not to obscure her vision by covering her eyes two mother tarantulas each with her young on her back came into contact and a battle a outrance took place one was slain but the double brood scattered by the conflict on its cessation climbed on to the back of the victor and remained calmly in position while she proceeded to dine in leisurely fashion on the vanquished in march seven months after hatching the young were ready to start life for themselves their first action was to climb to the highest points attainable whence they set sail in the manner already described and were borne gently away in the air we can hardly leave the tarantula without saying something on the vexed question of spider venom all over the world there are certain particular spiders whose bite is especially feared among them are the tarantula and the malmignant of southern europe the von coho of madagascar the katipo of new zealand and the kahooge of the west indies quite an extensive literature has arisen around the subject but its perusal leaves one not much wiser than one was before circumstantial accounts of death from the bite of a spider are countered by the assertions of experimenters that they have allowed themselves to be bitten repeatedly by the same species without suffering any inconvenience there is at all events some basis for the popular view in the fact that all spiders possess a poison gland which is analogous to that of the snake inasmuch as it opens near the tip of the fang which is plunged into the animal attacked in the case of the large powerful spiders of the family megalidae and perhaps in the tarantulas the effects of the bite on higher animals are not negligible and clearly exceed the results of a mere puncture a young sparrow and a mole bitten by fabre's tarantula in spots by no means vital died within a few hours but it is a very remarkable fact that many of the most dreaded spiders are neither large nor powerful the malmignate the von coho and the katipo and the kahooge are all members of the comparatively weak jawed therididae and their only striking characteristic is vivid coloration all being marked with red spots it is probable that their deadly powers are almost entirely fabulous and that they have been singled out as particularly dangerous merely because of their conspicuous appearance the smaller species are certainly harmless as far as man is concerned and it is even disputed whether their poison plays much part in the ordinary slaying of insects the very inconsistent results of experiments may be due to some control exercised by the spider over the output of poison there is no proof that its ejection is automatic and it is quite possible that the spider is economical in its use or again in some of the cases of innocuous biting the supply of venom may have run short end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jumping Spiders. We are not in the land of the jumping spiders or Atidae, and our few and sober colored examples of the group give but a feeble idea of the added fauna of tropical countries where these creatures abound and often rival the ruby tail flies in the brilliancy of their hues it is one of the largest groups numbering several thousand species but the british list includes barely thirty and most of these are of rare occurrence 
or at all events exceedingly unlikely to be met with by any but the most energetic collector indeed it may be said that there is only one british species which we may look forward with tolerable confidence to finding upon some sunny wall or fence in the summer in whatever part of the country we may be this is salticus senecus sometimes called the zebra spider though absolutely dowdy in comparison with most of its tropical cousins it is a not unattractive little creature and illustrates sufficiently well the characteristics of its tribe armed with a pocket lens a glass tube or two and more necessary still the very largest amount of patience we can summon we go in quest of the zebra spider a tarred fence is a good hunting ground because the spider if present is readily seen but if this is drawn blank we must have recourse to a wall where sharper eyesight will be required our quarry is of small size not more than a quarter of an inch long in the body which resembles that of the wolf spiders in build the abdomen not rising above the level of the forebody or cephalothorax it is thickly clothed with short hairs black white and gray so arranged as to show oblique zebra-like stripes on either side of the abdomen the legs are short and robust very different from the long thin limbs of the garden spider especially strong are the forelegs the head is broad and square with a high perpendicular forehead but the most remarkable features are the eyes on the vertical front are four splendid eyes the wolf spider's eyes are large but these in comparison are immense especially the median pair their axes are directed straight in front four other eyes are placed on the top of the head far apart from each other the more forward pair very small the hind pair of moderate size in some added spiders these great anterior eyes are wonderful objects under the microscope deep sea green in hue and fringed with colored hairs they form a veritable battery which the spider brings to bear upon the object of its chase human eyes to match them in comparative size would literally have to be as large as saucers if we are in luck we soon descry a salticus showing up boldly against the black surface of the fence and to set ourselves to watch its antics attentively one thing strikes us at once it is quite at home on a perpendicular surface nay on the underside of a horizontal beam for that matter now a garden spider would have great difficulty in maintaining itself in such a position unless well supplied with silken lines to which to cling evidently there is some difference in the structure of the feet of these spiders which may be worth investigating later on also we notice some odd tricks of movement in the jumping spider a curious way of exploring the surface on which it is working by a succession of short runs alternately with periods of absolute stillness as though on the qui vive a noticeable freedom of movement between the fore and the hind bodies so that its battery of eyes may be directed to this side or that sometimes an elevation of forepart as though for the purpose of obtaining a wider view we may have to wait long before we see it successful in the chase it will often patiently explore a large area testing the surface with its palps as it goes without any obvious reward it conscientiously searches all depressions and crannies and sometimes remains in them for a considerable time perhaps to devour some minute creature which did not call into play its special methods of attack 
At last, it sights a small insect which has alighted on the fence a few inches away. We see it turn its head in that direction and remain motionless. Soon it begins to edge nearer in a stealthy manner, striving to approach its prey from behind, till, with a sudden spring, it pounces on its back. Not always is the spring successful. Often the insect sees its peril at the last moment and takes to wing. But in this case, how does the spider avoid a fall? We see what we had not noticed before, that it is anchored to the fence by a silken line. Indeed, all the time it has been hunting, it has been trailing behind it an exceedingly fine thread of silk which it has attached at frequent intervals to the fence so that it can check its fall at will in the case of accident at the right angle we may see the delicate filaments glistening in the sun over the surface of its explorations the garden spider entangles its prey in a web the wolf spider runs it down by sheer strength and speed but the jumping spider stalks it like a red indian the actions of the spider make it quite evident that its power of sight is well developed mr and mrs peckham whose remarkable observations on the mating habits of jumping spiders must presently be considered established friendly relations with some of their captives which became so tame as to jump on their hands and take food from their fingers. They frequently induced them to jump from a finger of one hand to one of the other, gradually increasing the distance up to eight inches. They also twice observed a male chasing a female upon a table covered with jars, books, and boxes. The female would leap rapidly from one object to another or would dart over the edge of a book or a box so as to be out of sight in this position she would remain quiet for a few moments and then creeping to the edge would peer over to see if the male were still pursuing her if he happened not to be hidden she would seem to see him even when ten or twelve inches away and would quickly draw back moreover that they have the ability to discriminate colors has been shown by their behavior when imprisoned in cages consisting of a series of communicating chambers each with a glass top of a different hue they show a marked preference for the red chamber under these circumstances while the least attractive color seems to be blue it has been known for a long time that the males of many kinds of birds especially of the more ornamental species are accustomed to perform the most extraordinary antics in the presence of the female at the time of mating the peckhams made the unexpected discovery that precisely similar love dances took place in the case of the jumping spiders even the comparatively sober colored zebra spider performs a weird pasul in courting its mate but its display is feeble compared with that of some of the more ornate of the atidae certain isolated observations on captive jumping spiders led these observers to suspect that the mating habits were unusual and worthy of accurate investigation and they laid their plans accordingly taking their summer holiday a month earlier than usual so as to miss nothing of the pairing season and including in their party an artist whose drawings should furnish an indubitable record of the attitudes assumed by the male spiders in their evolutions on arriving at their destination they found a small species satus pulex with no great claims to remarkable beauty mature and ready to pair a female was placed in one of the experimental boxes which had been provided in advance and a male was admitted on the following day 
he sighted her at a distance of twelve inches and showing signs of excitement advanced to within about four inches and then performed a most ludicrous dance something in the nature of a highland fling in a semicircle before her she in the meantime moving in such a manner as to keep him always in view his exact behavior was this he extended all the legs and the palp on the left side folding the first two legs and the palp of the right side under him and leaning over sideways so far as nearly to lose his balance and in this attitude he sidled along towards the lowered right side till he had described an arc of about two inches then the position was instantly reversed the right legs being extended and the left folded under and the arc retraced a male was seen to repeat this performance one hundred eleven times he then approached nearer and when almost within reach whirled madly around and around her she joining and whirling with him after which she accepted him as a mate the next species to engage attention was an isius it was noteworthy that although the neighborhood was well known to the experimenters they had never met with this spider before but for a few days it swarmed on the fences just as birds are known to assemble from all quarters for the so-called love dances after the mating season the spiders wandered off into the woods again and were seen no more the performance was much as before but the spiders assumed different attitudes the female lay flat on the ground with her front legs raised the male danced on the six hind legs with the front legs lowered and meeting at the tips the males of this species were exceedingly quarrelsome sparring frantically whenever they met but their battles were entirely bloodless indeed say the observers having watched hundreds of seemingly terrible battles between the males of this and other species the conclusion has been forced upon us that they are all sham affairs gotten up for the purpose of displaying before the females who commonly stand by interested spectators in the case of one species after two weeks of hard fighting between the males the peckhams were unable to discover one wounded warrior the females on the other hand were often really formidable phidippus morsitans is an example the male has handsome front legs thickly fringed with white hairs and he displays these to the best advantage in his love antics two males supplied in succession to one female had offered her only the merest civilities when she leaped upon them and killed them in the case of most of the spiders whose love dances were investigated the chief ornamentation of the male consisted of fringes of white or colored hairs on the face the palps and the front legs and they kept these parts always before the females displaying their glories to the utmost advantage the male of habrocestum splendens however possesses an extremely brilliant abdomen and lest anything of its beauty should be lost upon the object of his admiration he varies the ordinary performance in a remarkable manner he often pauses in the dance and raising his abdomen strikes an attitude in which he remains motionless for half a minute moreover he frequently turns his back on the female a most unusual occurrence in the course of these antics the males of one species phileus militaris were observed to capture and keep guard over young females which they imprisoned in webs spun for the purpose until they had undergone their last molt and were mature chasing away all intruders in the interval 
the jumping spiders furnish a much stronger case for those who believe that ornamentation plays an important part in sexual selection than do either birds or butterflies with regard to the birds it has been objected first that there is little evidence that the females pay much attention to the antics of the males and secondly that practically all the male birds pair whatever their claims to preeminent beauty now in the case of the jumping spiders the females follow the performances of the males with the utmost attention and seeing that the males are present in large numbers when the females begin to appear the latter are certainly in the position to reject such mates as do not please them the mere relation of the results of this most interesting investigation conveys no hint of the unwearied patience and close observation necessary to those who would surprise the secrets of nature one is apt to infer that it is only needful to place some spiders in a box establish oneself in an armchair and ring on the performance so to speak the peckhams modestly remark the courtship of spiders is a very tedious affair we shall condense our descriptions as much as possible but it must be noted that we often worked four or five hours a day for a week in getting a fair idea of the habits of a single species end of chapter ten chapter eleven of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain there are faucet spiders it is quite impossible in a work like the present to deal with the classification of spiders about forty families have been established some of them of vast extent the atidae for example including some four thousand species the great french arachnologist m e simon has occupied two thousand quarto pages in defining the families subfamilies and genera without concerning himself with the species at all it is however desirable that the attention of the reader should be called to the primary division of the group according to which all spiders are either erinae verae true spiders or erinae therophosae therophosid spiders now these two kinds of spiders may readily be distinguished by a single easily observable characteristic the nature of the mandibles or chelicerae but it is necessary to describe the spider's mandibles before the difference can be appreciated their nature is perhaps best explained by saying that each mandible is not unlike a penknife with a single small blade rather more than half open when in use closed when at rest the handle of the penknife is certainly in most cases very short and thick and the blade not really a blade at all for it has no cutting edge but is a fang or piercing instrument generally somewhat curved and with a sharp point the blade is moreover perforated by a tube which comes from the poison gland situated in the thickened handle or in the spider's head so that poison can be forced into the wound which it inflicts now take two pen knives with the blades half open and hold them so that they hang with the hinge downward and with the blades directed towards each other it is clear that the blades may be made to pierce an object situated between them by moving the handles laterally the object being attacked simultaneously on either side this is the arrangement in the true spiders whose jaws move sideways though they do not always hang perpendicularly but are more often somewhat slanted forwards to represent the jaws of the therophosid spider the pen knives must be arranged differently 
place the handles horizontally and parallel to each other with the blades directed downwards and also parallel they will now work not sidewise but up and down and both fangs will pierce the victim from above in a word the two spiders have jaws which can be separated or brought together and which tend to meet in the object into which they are plunged while the jaws of theraphosid spiders work in parallel vertical planes and strike downwards all the spiders which have so far concerned us are arinae verae and we have incidentally had occasion to note some of the principal families of that division epiridae or argiopidae as some prefer to call them theridae agilinidae thomisidae lycosidae and atidae indeed there is only one theraphosid spider that there is the least likelihood of our coming across in this country their true home is in hotter climes and though stragglers from their army are not rare in the warmer portions of temperate regions they abound only in tropical countries they include the trapdoor spiders common in the mediterranean region and in many other widely distant parts of the world and the great bird-eating spiders of the tropics the spiders which are quite wrongly but universally alluded to in america as tarantulas the single british example is well worth the study of any reader who is fortunate enough to come across it but he must first catch his hair for atypus affinis or piceus as it used to be called does not grow in every hedgerow nor is it easy to find it where it does occur most of the localities recorded are in the south of england it is a thick-set dark-colored spider about half an inch in length and with very thick powerful mandibles which as we have seen work vertically its nest is a loosely woven tubular structure which partly lines a more or less vertical hole in the ground and partly lies exposed on the surface but which does not present any obvious opening for entrance and exit the situation chosen is generally a sloping sandy bank covered with vegetation the burrow is about eight inches in depth and about three quarters of an inch in diameter near the bottom it narrows and then expands into a somewhat wider chamber where the spider lives and constructs its egg cocoon the portion of the tube above the ground is sometimes longer but more often shorter than the buried portion and it tapers to a closed end mr joshua brown who first found this spider near hastings in eighteen fifty six took home several of the tubes with the spiders inside he could find no opening and though the spiders moved up and down the tubes they did not emerge on tearing a tube open he found no remains of insects inside but in one case he came across a worm partly within and partly outside the lower part of the tube and apparently partially devoured by the spider the same species is not rare in france and m simon's observations on it closely agreed with those of mr brown he believed that the spider chiefly depended for its food on earthworms which in the course of their burrowings came casually into its neighborhood since these observations however considerable light has been thrown on the habits of the spider by enoch who found colonies on hampstead heath and near woking his investigations extended over several years and wonderful patience was needed before the secrets of this curious animal were divulged it appears that the female when once established never leaves the nest at all the aerial portion of the web was always a puzzle but now we know thanks to enoch 
that it constitutes the whole hunting ground of the spider like promises and pie crust it is apparently made to be broken if it is accidentally brushed against by a passing insect the spider is instantly aware of the fact rushes to the spot and transfixes the intruder with its powerful mandibles it turns on its back to do this and strikes the insect from behind afterwards pulling its prey through the weft and into the tube by main force it drags it to the bottom of the tunnel makes sure of its death and immediately returns and repairs the rent insects were held against the tube and the spider if hungry accepted them at once if replete however it always gave a tug at the tube which retracted a portion of it into the burrow a curious action which enoch quite learnt to interpret as the i don't want any more movement the males made nests exactly like the females but shallower and they left them to search for their mates leaving the ends open on finding a female nest they serenaded by tapping with their palps and after some delay tore open the web and entered by and by the female came up and repaired the rent first pulling the edges together with her jaws and then uniting them with silk from her spinnerets in one case nothing more was seen of the male for nine months when his empty skin was observed at the end of the tube after nine months of connubial bliss his consort had devoured him in the autumn and spring eggs and newly hatched young were often found in the nests late in march a small hole one sixteenth inch in diameter was noticed at the end of some of the webs and presently the young began to emerge never to return to the nest they immediately climbed the highest objects at hand and some were seen to be carried off by the breeze enoch found by an ingenious experiment that the sand which is incorporated in the aerial part of the tube no doubt to render it inconspicuous is obtained from within and not from outside the nest carefully covering the exposed web he powdered the ground all around it with red brick dust but the particles which the spider embedded in the web were of brown sand evidently obtained from the bottom of the burrow and not from the surrounding surface but in the case of some newly dispersed young spiders he was able to see this operation performed the first part of the nest to be made was the aerial portion at the foot of which the digging was commenced particles of sand were brought up in the jaws of the young spider and pushed into the weft of the tube occasionally the jaws were thrust through the delicate web and particles from without were seized and pulled into the silken fabric it is sad to have to relate that such young spiders as did not emerge from the web within a reasonable time were devoured by their unnatural parent it sometimes happened that a change of weather rendered it unsuitable for the departure of the young and in this case the mother closed up the exit hole and retired to feed upon her offspring thus though there were as many as a hundred and forty in a brood a good many perished at the outset and the ants in the surrounding soil accounted for some of the rest the atipidae form a small outlying group of the theraphosid spiders and are able to live in colder regions than most of their relatives the great bulk of the division belong to the family of vincularidae some of the vincularidae are not unlike agelena in their mode of life spinning a dense sheet web terminating in a tube and entrapping their prey far the greater number however as far as their habits are known at all are earth dwellers 
either inhabiting more or less complex burrows of their own or sheltering under stones or in chance cavities by day and emerging at night to seek food in the immediate neighborhood of their hiding places some of them are quite small but the majority are large robust spiders of formidable appearance the largest known spider therophosa liblondi is found in south america and its body measures more than three and a half inches in length few spiders have attracted more attention than the fabricators of the curious trap door nests which are common in the riviera and indeed in all the countries bordering the mediterranean but abundant though they are they are extremely difficult to find and it is generally only by chance that their existence is detected the tarantula occasionally closes the mouth of her tunnel with a sheet of silk in which are encrusted the debris of insects or particles of soil she does this at the time when she is spinning her cocoon and any intrusion is particularly inopportune but she does it also on other occasions which are not so easily accounted for a reason which would naturally occur to us would be the exclusion of excessive rain or excessive sunshine but the facts unfortunately do not accord with this explanation now however desirable occasional closure may be a permanent door would hamper the tarantula in her hunting operations but the habits of the trapdoor spider are different and she closes her retreat with a wonderful hinged lid or trap door and the commonest form of trap door is also the most perfect being thick and tapering and fitted accurately into the beveled mouth of the tube like a stopper in the mouth of a bottle it is made of alternate layers of spider silk and earth and is free for more than half its circumference the remaining portion of the surface disc being attached to the side of the tube by a flexible hinge of silk mogridge dissected the door of a full-sized tunnel into fourteen graduated discs the smallest and of course the lowest represented the first door ever made by the spider and the successively larger discs indicated the stages at which its increasing size rendered an enlargement of the tube and therefore of the door necessary the spider always interweaves vegetable matter from the neighborhood into each new disc so that as a rule it is entirely indistinguishable from its surroundings when closed and not only dead vegetable matter for if the tube is situated amongst moss moss grows upon the lid from our previous experience however we shall not be surprised to find that blind instinct and not forethought is responsible for this action mogridge removed the lid of a tunnel and also cleared the ground immediately round it of all vegetation nevertheless when the spider made a new door it covered it with moss taken from the undisturbed vegetation beyond so that the trap door was now conspicuous as a green oasis in a sandy desert and on another occasion a spider interwove fragments of scarlet fabric left purposely at hand into the lid of its tunnel it is clear therefore that the decoration of the door is due to an instinct which impels the spider to utilize any material in the neighborhood without any regard to the effect produced the tube is densely lined with silk which affords its architect a secure foothold and if any enemy attempts to open the lid from without the spider resists with all its strength which is not inconsiderable clinging on to its under surface with its front legs and jaws while the claws of its other feet grasp the silken walls of the tube the other type of trap door is less interesting and much more elementary consisting simply of a wafer-like sheet of silk mixed with earth and vegetable matter but it is a curious fact 
that while all known trapdoor nests of the cork type are simple tubes the burrows with wafer doors are much more complex in some cases there is a branch tube like that constructed by lycosa picta leaving the main tunnel at a depth of some three inches and reaching the surface perhaps two inches away from the trap door so that the whole excavation is y shaped this branch tube is permanently closed by a thin sheet of silk and earth which however it would not be difficult to break through if it were urgent for the spider to escape while the enemy was exploring the main tunnel but a more interesting case is the occurrence of another trap door some way down the tube if the tube is unbranched this forms merely a second line of defense if the outer door is forced but in the case of a branched tube the additional door hangs at the fork of the y and is so shaped as to form a perfect valve so that the spider by holding it against one or the other side of the tunnel can connect the bottom limb of the y with either fork at will leaving to the intruder a beautifully smooth lined tube to explore with no hint of the possibility of escape in other directions there are sometimes other complications in the ramification of the tube but these need not detain us each species of spider adheres to its own particular type of architecture and may safely in a given neighborhood be identified by its nest as with the lycosidae the burrowing is all done by the mandibles but here the first joint the handle of the penknife is of more importance than the blade or fang indeed the burrowing species of the avicularidae may be distinguished from the rest by their mandibles which are provided in front with a rastellum or row of teeth for digging a trapdoor spider then does not go to work like a rabbit or a terrier scratching and kicking away the earth as it digs it laboriously dislodges particles of soil with its powerful mandibles and carries away the loosened fragments to deposit them at a distance the trapdoor spiders of the mediterranean region are nocturnal creatures and little is known of their habits erber relates that a species found in the island of tinos comes out at night fixes open the trap door with a few threads and spins a web near its nest to entrap passing insects clearing away any trace of it before dawn in the case of some chinese and also some australian species observers allege that they frequently wander from their nests in the daytime a californian species was able to leave its nest when the trap door was weighted with three ounces of lead on re-entering it seized the edge of the door with its mandibles and raising it slightly inserted its front legs it then turned round and slipped backwards into the tube it always resisted the forcible opening of its door to the last moment when it let go and slid into the tube as though going down a well the larger avincularidae have acquired a reputation for feeding on birds and this has given rise both to their scientific and their popular name bird eating spiders several travelers have stated that they have observed them with birds in their grasp and there is no doubt of their ability to kill any small bird or mammal though it is probable that they seldom have the opportunity, for they spin no snare in which birds may be caught. Even without the aid of their poison, their jaws are so large and powerful that they may easily attain the vital organs of small animals. Probably their staple food consists of the larger insects. They live in holes in the ground, or in trees, or sometimes in the fork of a tree branch in such hiding places they spend the hours of daylight emerging at night in search of food their large size and uncanny appearance have attracted the attention of the collector 
and a great many species are known but the fact that they chiefly inhabit tropical countries has militated against any very extended study of their habits and the few items of information we possess are best related with regard to the particular spider observed and not taken as necessarily characteristic of the whole tribe there is little doubt that they live for several years mccook kept a specimen of dugicella hensi in captivity for five and a half years and he considered that when it reached him it was at least a year and a half old and probably more the same species has recently been made the subject of some very interesting observations by petrunkovich who obtained numerous living specimens from texas and kept them in captivity unless carefully packed they bore the railway journey badly and it was above all things necessary to supply them with water the captives were fed on grasshoppers crickets cockroaches and wolf spiders but they ate sparingly one grasshopper sufficing for three days in the summer while in the winter hardly any food at all was taken the sense of touch is extremely well developed in these spiders but in sight hearing and smell they are strangely deficient no response whatever was obtained to either high or low notes a cricket sang for hours quite close to a spider which had been kept hungry for several days without attracting any attention it is very remarkable by the way that insects show no instinctive dread of these formidable creatures not attempting to keep at a distance and indeed frequently running over them in trying to find a way out of the cage nor do the spiders seem to be at all guided by smell they evince no knowledge of the presence of insects which emit a strong odor nor do they react to such tests as those to which the garden spider was subjected unless strong irritants such as chlorine are employed in the perception of which it is perhaps unnecessary that smell in the strict sense should take any part they have eight eyes two of them round and rather business-like in appearance and the others oval or pear-shaped and they are very sensitive to light retreating at once from the direct rays of the sun or from a light flashed on them but they do not appear to see anything at all recognizing neither friends nor enemies by sight however close at hand it was far otherwise with a wolf spider in the same cage running towards the dugicella it was clearly aware of it at a distance of several inches and could not be persuaded to approach nearer but the supremacy of the sense of touch is most striking when the spiders are courting when the male is seeking the female he seems quite unaware of her proximity unless he accidentally brushes up against her if he loses contact for a moment he is quite at sea and wanders blindly about turning perhaps to the left when the least motion to the right would bring them together again this frequently happens when he has accidentally touched the female with one of the hind legs he immediately turns about and if she is still there all is well but if she has chanced to move out of reach he is quite at a loss neither sight nor sound nor smell guide him but touch only the delicacy of this sense however is quite remarkable he seems to be aware at once of the nature of the object which touches him assuming a threatening attitude if the touch is hostile or pouncing instantly if hungry and the touch is that of a passing insect if however the insect is lucky enough to escape it is in no danger of pursuit as in the case of many spiders though by no means of all his courting is not unattended with peril the tragic fate which sometimes overtakes the male spider has so hit the popular imagination that there is a general impression that the female spider is a confirmed misanthrope 
and desires the life of any suitor bold enough to approach her not at all we have simply to remember that spiders are carnivorous and prone to cannibalism if the female happens to be hungry she makes no nice discrimination between an amorous male and a succulent grasshopper if replete she may find time for the play of softer emotions the male of d hensi appears to be more or less prepared for a hostile reception on the part of the female for the thighs of his front legs are furnished with spurs at their extremity and with these he holds back and renders powerless her threatening fangs there is no doubt that the spider's delicate sense of touch resides in the hairs with which both body and limbs are thickly clothed they are of various kinds fine hairs bristles and stout spines and many of them are supplied with nerve fibers at the base the finer hairs are probably not sensory and they are in the case of some avincularid spiders very easily shed and have a strong irritant action on the hand that touches them not unlike the sting of a nettle it is not at all unusual for one large avincularid spider salmopius cambridgei to be brought over to england in cases of bananas from the west indies mr james adams of dunfurling has kept two specimens alive for a considerable time the first specimen lived in captivity for two years and nine months during which it molted five times but grew very little in size arriving in september it was at first fed on flies and in a few weeks when these began to fail it accepted beetles consuming about three a day in november even these insects were difficult to obtain and recourse was had to cockroaches at first about three cockroaches a week were eaten but the number decreased until in the middle of march it ceased feeding altogether and on april thirteenth it cast its skin it molted again in october and twice a year for the rest of its life in spring and autumn during six months it took no food at all and very little for four months previously at the last molt but one it lost a limb which however reappeared when the spider again changed its skin though it never attained the proper size with spiders as with insects molting is a very serious matter involving much more than the mere casting off of an external coat if all does not go well limbs may easily be lost in the operation nor is it rare to meet with instances in which the animal has perished in its unsuccessful attempt to discard the old integument mr adams's second specimen was kept alive for three years and ten months it molted only once each year in june or july and it died in the act of casting its skin in the case of these spiders also it was noted that insects supplied to them as food displayed no fear whatever there were always a few cockroaches in the same box and they were often observed actually with the spider in its nest but no notice was taken of them unless their host chanced to be hungry a photograph of this spider is given in the frontispiece it is an interesting fact that many of the avincularidae of southern asia and australia possess a sound producing apparatus which is entirely lacking in african and american forms but this is a subject which deserves a chapter to itself End of chapter 11chapter 12 of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain stridulation many of the arthropoda the large group which includes insects and crustaceans as well as arachnida are able to produce sounds a fact familiar enough in such insects as crickets and grasshoppers as however 
the breathing apparatus of these animals is entirely different from that of mammals and has no connection whatever with the mouth and alimentary canal the mode of sound production is not at all the same instead of setting vocal cords in vibration by the expulsion of air through the larynx insects sing or chirp by rapidly rubbing together certain specially roughened surfaces which constitute what is called a stridulating organ in crickets for instance each tegmen or wing cover is provided with a kind of file and when the wing covers are rapidly vibrated the edge of each rubs against the opposite file and a shrill sound is produced the stridulating apparatus is by no means always in the same place the thorax may rub against the abdomen the leg against the wing cover or one of the mouth appendages against another nor are the sounds produced always audible to human ears at all events there are many creatures with what appear to be very well developed stridulating organs whose note has never yet been heard by any naturalist but there are doubtless numberless sounds beyond the range of our hearing which is limited like the keyboard of a piano now such a stridulating apparatus has been detected in many spiders and always in one of three situations either between the two parts of the body cephalothorax and abdomen or between the palps and the mandibles or between the palps and the front legs in some of the theridiidae the hind end of the cephalothorax is roughened and fits into a sort of socket in the abdomen which is provided with parallel ridges so that when the abdomen is vibrated the two surfaces are rubbed together but no one has yet heard a sound produced by these spiders the stridulating avicularidae however are easily heard the sound in some cases being described as a kind of whistle in others it has been said to have the effect of shot dropping upon a plate there are two quite distinct purposes for which sounds may be produced they may either serve as a call from one sex to the other or as a warning to intruders obviously the first purpose requires a sense of hearing in the sex appealed to and it is interesting to note that in the theridiidae which are among the spiders which show some appreciation of sound the organ is well developed in the male only being rudimentary or altogether absent in the female while in the avicularidae which appear to be quite deaf both sexes possess it equally in them its function is probably to warn off its enemies a purpose for which it is not at all necessary that the spider itself should hear it sometimes sounds have been quite wrongly attributed to spiders there is for example an australian species widely known among natives as the barking or booming spider for no better reason than that the spider has been found in the daytime at a spot where the booming was heard at night this case was investigated by professor baldwin spencer who found that quails were really responsible for the sounds with which the spider was credited the creature could however achieve a kind of whistle by rubbing its palps against its mandibles its stridulating apparatus was of the type common among the avicularidae its principle is that of the musical box where nail-like projections on a barrel strike against the teeth of a metal comb except that the barrel is stationary and the comb is moved up and down against it the barrel is here represented by the first joint of the mandible which is beset on its outer side with spines the inner edge of the first joint of the palp is furnished with keys 
which are rubbed against the mandible spines when the palps are vibrated these keys are very curious structures they are of various lengths and their shape will perhaps be understood when it is said that a tolerable model of one would be obtained by taking a flat iron bar sharpening it at the end and then so twisting it in the middle that the flat surface of one half is at right angles to the flat surface of the other half its appearance therefore varies according to the point of view the narrow edge of one half and the broad edge of the other being visible at the same time a moment's consideration will show that this torsion is calculated to give great rigidity to the keys for when the outer half is struck on the flat surface the inner half opposes its greatest diameter to the shock a similar structure is found in all the theraphosid spiders which are able to produce a sound though sometimes the keys are on the mandibles and the spines on the palp in staten island there is a wolf spider lycosa cochi which is known as the purring or drumming spider because of a curious habit which the male has at mating time of rapidly drumming on the dead leaves in a wood with its palps it runs hither and thither over the ground as if in search of something pausing at short intervals to purr and the sound has frequently been heard and correctly attributed to the spider before the way in which it is produced was discovered in this case it is probable that the production of sound is not the object of the spider at all for we have no evidence that wolf spiders hear. On the other hand, rapid tapping with the palps is a very characteristic action with male spiders at mating time, and it is easy to believe that contiguous dry leaves would conduct vibrations to a female at some distance away and inform her of the presence of the male. Just so, as we have seen, our english theraphosid announces his arrival by tapping on the exposed part of the nest of the female end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of spiders by cecil warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain the spinning apparatus and the feet seeing that the possession of spinnerets is a characteristic of all spiders and that a great deal of the interest attaching to their life history arises from their spinning operations any account of the group however brief would be incomplete without some attempt to describe these remarkable organs among the spiders to which the attention of the reader has been directed some have been highly accomplished spinners constructing complicated snares retreats and egg cocoons while in the case of others the spinning work is very meagre and employed chiefly for the protection of the eggs as might be expected the organs attain a very much higher development in some spiders than in others and the most complex of all are those of the Epiridae, the constructors of the circular snare. Now, in the first place, it is rather striking that the spiders with the most conspicuous spinnerets are by no means the most able spinners. The bird-eating spiders are a case in point, for they spin very little yet two of their spinnerets are much more obvious than anything Epeira has to show, for they protrude behind the body and strike the eye at the first glance. Indeed, excessive length has nothing to do with the complexity, but is found wherever a wide sweep is necessary in laying down the threads, as we saw in the case of Agelina, when constructing its sheet web. Roughly speaking, 
the spinnerets are very mobile finger-like projections generally situated under the hind end of the abdomen and bearing more or less numerous tubes from which the silken threads proceed the usual number of spinnerets is six but there is a pretty wide range one group of spiders having only two while a few possess eight the spinnerets then are only the bearers of the actual tubes which emit the silk the distribution of the tubes themselves is different in the different kinds of spiders but it is usually possible to distinguish two kinds there are generally present a large number of very fine cylindrical tubes or spools and a few conical tubes of much larger base which are called spigots each of these orifices whether on spool or spigot is connected by a fine tube with a separate silk gland or organ for manufacturing silk situated within the spider's abdomen apira has about six hundred of such glands each with its own terminal spool or spigot and the large number of these tubes has given rise to a misconception that is very widely spread namely that the spider's line fine as it is is quotes woven of hundreds of threads of very much finer silk this is not so as we shall presently see though epira has some six hundred silk glands it has only five different kinds of gland manufacturing silk of different properties no other family of spiders has so many though two other kinds of gland have been found in less elaborate spinners within the spider the silk is fluid but it solidifies on meeting the air each thread hardening as it emerges though still continuous with the fluid contents of the gland so that the drawing out of a silken thread is just like the operation so familiar with the glue pot or with spun glass except that the hardening is not due to cooling but to exposure to the air this general description will it is hoped make an account of the organs in epeira more comprehensible the spinnerets of epeira are so small and inconspicuous that their disposition is not very easy to make out when not in use they form a tiny cone under the tip of the abdomen and only four are visible their free ends being so brought together as entirely to conceal a small central pair there are really then three pairs of spinnerets which we may call at once the anterior median and posterior pairs though when at rest only the anteriors and posteriors can be seen if the spider is observed with a pocket lens as it crawls about in a glass tube it will be noticed that the spinnerets are capable of great mobility their ends can be separated or brought together or they may be made to rub against each other or against the sides of the tube the anteriors and posteriors moreover are two jointed though the medians consist only of a single joint so much can be seen without any great magnification but the microscope will be necessary if a complete understanding of their mechanism is to be arrived at what it reveals will now be briefly described and will it is hoped be made tolerably clear by the accompanying figures which are simplified by the omission of a large number of bristles which tend to hide the essential structure and by a great reduction in the number of spools though the spigots are all indicated the anterior spinneret that nearest the head end of the animal is a sort of cone divided into a large basal joint and a small terminal joint the latter bears on its inner side a single spigot 
and is crowned with a battery of spools about a hundred in number the median spinneret has three spigots two at the tip and one on the inner side and about a hundred spools mostly on its inner surface the posterior spinneret is divided very obliquely into two joints so that the terminal joint extends much lower down on the inner than on the outer side it has five spigots in groups of three and two and again there are about a hundred spools now the point that i wish to make clear is that there is no interweaving of the output of these various spools and spigots at the moment of emission the threads are adhesive and can be made to stick to the glass or to one another but they are not in any sense either fused or interwoven for ordinary operations the brunt of the work is borne by the anterior spigots marked a in the figure sometimes reinforced by silk from the spigots on the median spinnerets marked b the functions of all the other spools and spigots being special and occasional for instance when epeira is laying down a foundation line this is what happens the spider sits down so to speak on a twig separating its spinnerets and rubbing them on the surface as it raises its abdomen a multitude of little threads are seen merging into what appears to be a single line in reality the line is double emerging from the spigots on the anterior spinnerets and it can easily be separated into two and two only anywhere along its length the multitudinous spools have emitted short lengths of silk to anchor the foundation line at its commencement but they are then closed and have no share in the ever lengthening line as the spider lets itself drop or crawls away to attach it to a new spot one of their uses then is to anchor the main lines from the spigots to external objects but they have another function and not less important everybody has seen a garden spider trussing up a captured fly it is held in the jaws and front legs and slowly revolved while with its hind legs the spider draws out bands of silk from the spinnerets and swathes it like a mummy no silken rope this of fused or interwoven threads but a broad band every strand of which is separate and distinct and proceeds from a different spool two or three hundred fine threads wound simultaneously round the insect form a much more effectual winding sheet than would a single cord composed of them all so far we have accounted for the spools and for one pair of spigots those on the anterior spinnerets the lower spigot on the middle spinneret often assists in laying down a foundation line when extra strength is required in that case the line is fourfold and can easily be split into four along its whole length the threads from the middle spinnerets being rather finer than those from the anterior but composed of the same kind of silk there remain seven pairs of spigots whose function has still to be explained two on the middle and five on the posterior spinnerets the three which are clustered together on the posterior spinneret do not form silk at all that is the material they emit does not harden on exposure to the air but remains fluid and adhesive when the spider is spinning the viscid spiral of its web it is from these spigots that the sticky matter oozes enveloping the true silken lines and presently resolving itself into little globules in the manner already described the remaining spigots two on the middle and two on the posterior spinnerets are employed only in spinning the egg cocoon 
and the silk they produce is unlike that used in making the snare being much stronger and less elastic and in the case of the garden spider of a yellow color in the occasional attempts which have been made to substitute spiders for silkworms as commercial silk producers it is only this cocoon silk that has given any considerable results the produce of the other glands being far too frail for profitable use such attempts however have always failed principally for a reason quite unconnected with the particular nature of the silk namely the difficulty of keeping the spiders in captivity it is a simple matter to supply dozens of silkworms in the same box with mulberry leaves but spiders require separate compartments or they will fight and devour each other and the provision of suitable food for them is such a troublesome matter that it has proved quite impracticable on a commercial scale we have incidentally seen that there are quite a number of different operations in which the spinning apparatus takes part there is the line which most spiders lay down as they wander and which secures them from the danger of a fall if they lose their footing there is the snare for catching prey the nest or retreat and the egg cocoon and in addition silk from the spinnerets may be used to enwrap and paralyze captured insects or to assist the young spider to migrate since the epiridae perform all these operations and are moreover the most finished of snare makers it does not surprise us to find in them the highest development of the silk glands and the most complete battery of spools and spigots on the spinnerets many spiders as we know make no snare at all and in the case of some very little spinning is attempted beyond the manufacture of a rather rudimentary covering for the eggs naturally a less complex spinning apparatus is required and we accordingly find that jumping spiders for instance have only about fifty silk glands comprising three different kinds of gland while the glands found in such of the large aviculariidae as have been examined have been all alike there is in some spiders a spinning organ not to be found in apira which deserves a passing notice it does not take the place of spinnerets of which the usual three pair are present but it is situated in front of them and only occurs in the female of the species its peculiarity is that the silk does not emerge from projecting spools but through fine holes in a sieve like plate called a crebellum which is flush with the surface of the abdomen it has no mobility therefore and the threads from it have to be combed out and distributed by the spider's hind leg for the better accomplishment of this purpose there is a special comb of stiff hairs or bristles called a calamistrum on each of the fourth pair of legs the web of these spiders is not unlike that of agelina but of a rather finer texture and it can be seen on magnification to consist of an irregular groundwork over which have been spread wavy bands of excessively fine silk combed out from the orifices of the cribellum glands some of these cribellate spiders of the genus amarobius are not uncommon in our cellars and outhouses their bodies are of stouter build and their legs much shorter than those of the common house spider we have no place for anything approaching a full description of the anatomy of spiders but there is one other point of structure of which the reader has been promised some account attention was directed to the fact that while some spiders are helpless on smooth perpendicular surfaces unless they have lines to cling to 
others can run with ease upon the walls or even the ceiling of a room the last joint or tarsus of the spider's leg is very different in the two cases it always terminates in claws either two or three so that any species can make some show of climbing where the surface is rough and there is anything to cling to but to obtain a hold on a polished surface it needs a special contrivance this takes the form of a pad of curiously modified hairs called a scopula the hairs are club-shaped narrow at their stalk and swelling towards the tip and their clinging power seems to be due to a viscid secretion the foot of any jumping spider will show this structure well epeira has no scopula and its climbing is always laborious unless it has a thread to cling to but it is supreme as a rope walker treading daintily on the most delicate threads mounting a line hand over hand with great agility and manipulating the silk in its various spinning operations with unerring skill and facility end of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Enemies of Spiders. When one comes to consider the multitudinous risks to which a spider is exposed during the whole course of its life, it seems at first a little surprising that the whole tribe has not long ago been exterminated spiders continue to flourish however and it is very clear that however careless nature may be of the individual she is extremely solicitous about the race the infant mortality among these creatures must be appalling there is first their cannibalistic propensity to be reckoned with newly hatched spiders while still within the cocoon seldom attack each other but as soon as ever each sets up for himself no quarter is given it often happens that members of a brood of sedentary spiders spin their first snares in close contiguity and if food is scarce they eat one another without compunction it is said that a few individuals of a brood may be reared to maturity on no other food than their sisters and brothers the case of the survivor of the nancy bell in the bab ballads would be exceedingly commonplace in the araniad world we have seen too how on occasion a tippus will devour her young if they do not leave the nest with due expedition then if the weather conditions chance to be unfavorable just at the period of departure from the cocoon broods are liable to perish wholesale washed away and destroyed by deluges of rain myriads too must be carried out to sea in the course of their ballooning operations and never come safely to land but the mortality is probably even greater at a still earlier stage for hosts of spiders eggs never hatch at all and this for two reasons in the first place the silk of spiders is a favorite material with many birds for the lining of their nests and many of them use the cocoons for this purpose secondly there are numerous ichneumon flies which attack and parasitize spiders cocoons piercing them with their ovipositors and laying their eggs inside the eggs of the ichneumon fly hatch first and feed upon the eggs of the spider two such flies are known to attack the cocoons of the garden spider and not a single spider will emerge from a cocoon thus parasitized the spiders whose cocoons are most subject to these attacks belong as might perhaps be expected to the sedentary groups 
and the most elaborate but unavailing precautions are often taken to render them ichneumon proof the cocoons of the peripatetic wolf spiders have never been observed to be parasitized even if a spider has survived these early perils there are still many dangers ahead during its period of growth it has to molt some eight or nine times and the operation is at least as dangerous as say an attack of measles to the human infant for some time beforehand feeding ceases and the animal becomes inert and apparently dead but presently the integument splits and out struggles the spider pale and soft and leaving behind it not only the outer skin but the lining of most of its alimentary canal and of its breathing tubes sometimes as we have said it fails to extricate itself and dies quite often it emerges with the loss of a limb which will reappear reduced in size at the next molt it is necessary to go into retreat for a time after molting till strength has returned and the integument has hardened but the dangers of molting though not negligible are insignificant beside others to which the spider is exposed during its later stages nor is a prolonged dearth of food necessarily fatal for as we have seen a spider can fast for an astonishing time and yet retain its health if it has a fair supply of water but there are terrible enemies at hand from which it has little or no protection birds of course come first for to most insectivorous birds spiders are acceptable morsels i have seen a hedge sparrow going conscientiously over a trellis work and picking out all the spiders from the nooks and corners then insectivorous mammals make no distinction between the insecta and the arachnida and often eat spiders with avidity as also will toads and lizards moreover ichneumon flies do not confine their attention to cocoons but often attack well-grown spiders they invariably lay their eggs on one spot at the very front of the abdomen near the cephalothorax where the spider is powerless to dislodge them the egg hatches out to a grub which is a veritable old man of the sea on the spider's back and there it remains until it causes the death of the victim by feeding on the contents of the abdomen four such ichneumon flies have been found to attack the garden spider and no kind of spider seems exempt how they contrive to deposit their eggs in the proper place without great danger of themselves falling a prey to their victims is a mystery to venture into a garden spider's web for the purpose would seem a foolhardy proceeding the actual deposition of the egg has seldom been witnessed but in one of the few cases that have come under observation the spider made little resistance and appeared quite demoralized it was hanging from a thread down which the ichneumon fly was seen to crawl when it reached the spider the latter dropped an inch lower on two or three occasions but then remained passive and the parasite on nearing it turned round backed down the line and with great care and deliberation attached an egg at the usual spot but no enemies of spiders are more terrible than some of the solitary wasps and gruesome indeed is the fate of any creature that falls into their clutches the social wasps often capture spiders to feed their young but in their case the proceeding is summary and without any finesse they merely catch a spider sting it to death cut it to pieces with their jaws 
and feed it into the mouths of their expectant grubs. The treatment is brutal enough, but at all events it is expeditious. Now, the solitary digger wasps never see their young. They make cells either by burrowing in the ground or by agglomerating particles of mud or gravel. And in each cell is placed an egg together with sufficient food to last the grub which hatches out for the whole of its larval existence. The mother will not be at hand, as is the social worker wasp, to supply new food as required, and it is therefore necessary so to arrange matters that the food provided may retain its fresh condition for at least a fortnight. On the other hand, the victims must be deprived of all power of motion, otherwise the egg will stand a great chance of being displaced and crushed, and even if it hatches, it will be unable to commence its meal upon the struggling spider. Now, in the whole range of animal instinct, there is nothing more remarkable than the manner in which the solitary wasps have learnt to solve this problem. The solution lies in so stinging the victim that it is paralyzed but not killed, and though quite unable to move, it neither shrivels nor decays, but remains perfectly sound and edible for two or three weeks. To accomplish this result, the wasp acts as though it possessed a knowledge of the minute anatomy of its victim, and knew to a hair's breadth the position of the principal nerve ganglia which controls its actions. Into these it unerringly thrusts its sting, but even accuracy of aim is not everything. There must be the finest discrimination in the severity of the wound. A slight excess and the animal is killed. Too timid a thrust will not destroy movement. When the delicate operation has been successfully performed, the paralyzed spider is dragged into the cell, placed on its back, and an egg carefully deposited at the base of its abdomen, after which the cell is sealed up. Some wasps, instead of providing a single large spider, store their cells with a number of smaller victims, all rendered limp and motionless. In attacking a spider, the first action of one of these wasps is to remove it from its natural environment. A garden spider in its web, or a burrowing spider in its tunnel, are more or less formidable. But if the one can be thrown down, or the other dragged forth into the open, they are well nigh defenseless. Therefore, in attacking an epirid, the wasp first darts at it, seizes a leg, and attempts to jerk it out of the web. If unsuccessful, the spider will now be on its guard, and the wasp leaves it and tries the same maneuver on another individual. Taken by surprise, it is instantly thrown to the ground and can then offer no effectual resistance. Even the large bird eaters fall victims to these terrible foes. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some Concluding Reflections In the foregoing pages, we have been able to deal with very few out of the vast number of known spiders. Yet the examples we have chosen for study are fairly typical of some of the more important groups and calculated to give a tolerably just idea of the general economy of the tribe. In any case, even such a fragmentary study as the present gives us food for thought. There is a question which the writer has so often been asked that he is inclined to deal with it in anticipation, 
though perhaps he is wronging his readers in supposing that they desire to propound any such conundrum this question is what is the use of spiders now underlying this question there is surely a very unwarranted assumption that all the myriad creatures which exist have as a reason for their existence some reference to the activities and desires of mankind as far as it has any meaning at all it amounts to this what benefit does man derive from spiders but it seems to take for granted that some benefits must accrue to man from these creatures or that they would not have the audacity to persist in living well if the question in this amended form is in urgent need of an answer the reply must be very little if any certainly spiders prey as a rule on insects and no doubt kill many which might injure us and in the constant battles between man and insect pests instances have been recorded where particular species of spider have fought on the side of man with appreciable effect but then they are as likely to devour our insect friends as our insect enemies impartially slaying the just together with the unjust so that little stress can be laid on their utility on this score indeed there is quite as good a case to be made out of man benefiting spiders as of spiders benefiting man for his architectural proclivities have provided some species with secure homes from which most of their enemies except man himself are excluded and where they are sheltered from the storms which are so fatal to their relatives outside protected from extremes of temperature and rendered so independent of times and seasons that the number of broods they produce in the year has increased whether a creature is useful or injurious is entirely a matter of the point of view there are several animals with regard to which the opinions of the farmer and the gamekeeper are diametrically opposed but if anything emerges from the study in which we have been engaged it is surely this fact that wherever there is a niche in nature capable of sustaining life to that niche some animal will sooner or later adapt itself without any reference to man's desires or interests we have seen spiders all built on the same ground plan so to speak and with the same essential organs so modified in the details of structure and inherited instincts as to be able to thrive under the most diverse conditions think for instance of the water spider and the desert tarantula or consider the difference in mode of life between the sedentary garden spider and the hunting attid incessant competition in the struggle for life no doubt urged on primeval spiders to strike out new modes of existence under slightly novel conditions the best adapted or most adaptable survived and were pioneers in the occupation of a new territory till the widely different capacities and habits which we now wonder at were slowly evolved another point to ponder on is the wonderful complexity of the instincts which govern the actions of spiders the extraordinary operations they can perform entirely untaught and of the object of which it is impossible to believe they are aware we have seen that in the most highly organized species the sense organs except perhaps that of touch are but moderately developed and the power of memory the basis of intelligent action but feeble yet their inherited impulses suffice for all ordinary emergencies and recur with unfailing precision at the proper periods of their lives they are machine-like perhaps but what extraordinarily competent machines 
the light of what we call intelligence burns low but a glimmer of it can be detected here and there if one comes to think of it the egg of a creature of complex instincts is a particularly wonderful atom it contains not only the germs of all the complicated bodily structure but there are bound up in it also the impulses that are to come into play at certain definite periods only of the spider's life history and these impulses are not mere vague reminders that now is the time to spin a snare or to weave an egg cocoon they prescribe precisely how it is to be done involving perhaps a dozen different spinning operations in one in varying order viewed in this light the germ of an insect or a spider would seem in a sense to be more complex than that of an animal whose vague instinctive impulses are under the direction of intelligence and can be carried out in a variety of ways according to circumstances one of the most surprising things about the egg of a spider is the amount of energy stored up in it a bird's egg huge in comparison contains material sufficient to build up the body of a fledgling just sufficiently active to be able to accept from the mother that first nutriment without which it will speedily die but turn back to the account of the tarantula spider its egg is small perhaps the twelfth of an inch in diameter and yet it not only produces a spiderling complete in form and provided with all the complex instincts of its tribe but there is so much energy to spare that for months without any new food supply the young spider can lead an active life frequently descending from and remounting its mother's back and can even put forth silk on its own account the objects which a conjurer produces from a hat seem trifles in comparison with the outcome of a spider's egg the actual material seems astonishing from so small a source but whence comes all this surprising surplus of energy fabre suggests that it is supplied by the direct rays of the sun to which the tarantula exposes in turn all parts of the egg cocoon all through their lives spiders seem to be gifted in a high degree with the power of extracting the utmost value in substance and in energy from their food consider the great theraphosid spiders the so-called bird eaters they have a massive body and great muscular power to sustain yet they are never heavy feeders and can go for many months without any food at all and it is not as though they were dormant during this period of abstention their vital processes seem to be going on as usual the whole time and they are ready at any moment to resent attack or to employ their spinning organs during their long fast true hibernation as we have seen does not occur in this group if it did there would be nothing remarkable in the occasional long abstention from food the vitality of a hibernating animal is practically at a standstill all its vital operations breathing blood circulation muscular action are reduced to the lowest possible limit and it very likely expends no more energy during its winter sleep than it would during a day or two of active summer life but of such reflections there is no end and many such will doubtless arise spontaneously in the mind of the thoughtful reader and it is for that very reason that the study of the life history of any animal is of such absorbing interest it is not contended that spiders are any more wonderful than any other group that might have been selected 
there is of course a special interest attaching to the study of animals very much nearer to man in bodily structure and mental equipment but the endeavor to understand the actions and appreciate the outlook on nature of creatures far remote from man however unsuccessful has its own fascination and this is what the mere collector entirely misses collecting is of course necessary for a complete examination is never possible in the living specimen and moreover without examples kept as types for reference we should lose our way in the multitude of living forms but as an end in itself it is of vastly inferior value the writer will be well content if he has succeeded in arousing the curiosity of some with regard to the humble life that surrounds us and in stimulating a few who possess the requisite keenness and patience to add to our store of knowledge by new observations of their own end of chapter fifteen end of spiders by cecil warburton read for librivox by sue anderson